Freddie, and uh, hopefully the power will stay on. Uh, All right, so this is optimal enforcement with evidence suppression. Um, motivated me to, to write this is uh, about you know, reading, the, reading the merger guidelines. And in the merger guidelines, they talk about how they will use evidence uh, in the party's documents, um, a evidence from the party's documents that indicates that they, there's competitive concern will be given a lot of weight, but absence of such evidence um, will not be given much weight in the and so thinking about, you know, to what extent does that make sense, right? How should we use evidence that is potentially manipulated? That evidence, you know, if not manipulated, is it potentially accurate? Um, but you know, is potentially manipulable, and then there's other types of evidence that's also available that may be um, not be um, is in principle accurate, but but potentially less less subject to. That's kind of a. So you know, you can think about. I think this happens in in a lot of regulation. I'm most familiar with trust, so that's why. I, Um, information that's under the same. So, for example, that we'll talk about, you know, exactly what. Ex post, they could also ex ante by saying, about this merger, please don't talk about any of this over email, right? You know, use the phone. Um, that, right, there's going to be some cost. That's not going to be trivial. Probably a reason why, in the normal course of things, these things end up used because it's. it's um, press to some degree, right? But you can't just press everything, right? You're going to have to produce something. Some suppression, but it's going to be. Easy. And I'm also going to assume there's some independent. Anonymous, it's a, a regular. Imagine if it's like a discrimination. It says about how they make hiring decisions. You can just look at. So again, that sort of question is how should enforcement decisions that type of, of imagining uh, strategy that makes suppression desirable and potentially deters the happen and optimize your use of the firm system. by making it less valuable, but it's impossible to deter it directly through punishment. And punish it, uh, the only thing that firms from suppressing the evidence is simply Three players um, in the model. There's an enforcer, and then there's a firm, and there's two types of firms. So there's one firm, but there's two bad firms, and so simplicity, I assume. Bad firm is the merger of that. Act or not, right? So you can merge or not merge, and you know that the firm's merge. Type, the regulator doesn't take an action, right? And it's so. Well, if it's a bad firm, it produces the cost of L or benefit. 
itself, right? If they don't do anything. How do be different? Um, they have sort of the, the roughly expected effects in terms of the, the current trade off here. Um, there's already lots of parameters running around in the model. So um, I, I take them sort of to be equal. In fact, you're going to produce two types of evidence. So type one evidence, that's the non-suppressible kind. Type one evidence, that's binary, right? It can be, right? Little b is suggestive of a bad type, little g is suggestive of a good type. The probability that the you produce type of evidence that matches your type, right? It's correct with probability q, and that's greater than half. So this evidence is we're also going to produce in pieces of type two evidence, right? So documents, and again, it's the same binary structure. For accurate, right? But each type is accurate with probability two. Question, right? So only type two evidence is, and I'm going to take a relatively simple. All but one of those pieces of all that doesn't cost you. Have to do something. Right? Value of n is going to be a measure of how effective suppression. So hard suppression can be very effective, right? If n but not really. Right, then the structure here is first you make the decision. As in, we don't really know as the, you know, when officers, what everyone has sent in the email, when we decide, okay, we're going to spend the time to comb through all of the email and delete the, delete the data. Right. Um, so, try to do that. Then you can look through and you have to decide to send that code. Type it, right. So you know if you have those damaging emails. Try to suppress evidence. Then you're going to produce. Good evidence to the regulator, unless all of this evidence is of the bad type, right? And then eight good evidence. So you have to show them something. I don't, right? So um, the enforcement. Both pieces of evidence are bad. You have to take an enforcement. Can't take an enforcement action, so that's that could be zero. And the third, what do you do if you have um, different probabilities, right? So type one of Adam, type two evidence is good, right? You get to choose what's the probability of enforcement. That, but just to be clear, if you don't suppress evidence. The regulator is going to randomly pick one piece of the type two evidence, so it's not going to observe all of it. It's just going to get at random that it's going. To... It is regulator private benefits in taking. Tries then to take an action. It's going to. At benefit and, and to decide whether or not it will press the, the type two evidence. Type one evidence, and as I said, action is taken, right? Have a sanction, right? That's 
So key simplifying private benefits are unrelated. To Imagine different situations. X um, private benefit, you might imagine private benefits are negatively correlated with wealth. Private benefits is the degree power that you get, right? But it should be positive if you think that five. So you know your type. How careless your employees are, you know, have been in talking about, it, right? So if I'm like, uh, if I'm the manager of, if I know whether this merger is primarily anti-competitive or not, but I don't know, like, have my sales force been sending emails? Oh, you know, this other firm is my close competitor. We really got to make sure we beat their prices, right? That's going to be pretty damaging. Whether that evidence, you know, they haven't been putting that kind of thing. So, first thing we have this evidence suppression decision, right? Types. So, those suppression decisions, type B firm again, I expected sanction if I suppress evidence, right? And that's given by, by this expression here. Bad firm, you're going to produce bad type one evidence with probability Q. And if all of your type two evidence is bad, then that's what you're going to end up. And if uh, that case, you know, both your evidence types would be bad, and you're going to be. On the other hand, it might be that bad ones for type two, and that's the probability of enforcement of. Add type one evidence and a good lucky in your type one evidence is good, despite the fact that you're a bad firm. So that's probability one minus two. Then again, you, know, you still might get an enforcement action if all of your type two are bad, and then you'll be enforced against with probability R of type one evidence and a bad type two. Right? So that's your expected sanction. And you have similar expression if you don't suppress. And the only difference here is instead of right now, we just use P because we take a random evidence. You don't get the P. And on whether your cost is the same. Fission, right? And as you can see right there, and is a more valuable suppression um, sanction, the more valuable it is to suppress. Analogous consideration for the good type firm and that's the probabilities of, of getting good that evidence are flipped. Right? Not surprisingly, the suppression incentive. Probability of enforcement when you have a good type one and a bad type two and decreasing. Not when you make your, not before the suppression, right? So you have to decide to comb through the email. So what's in there? You know whether you're good or bad, so you know the but you don't know exactly what's going to Evidence, it could be a bad firm, but maybe you, maybe. Bad type firm is going to be more influenced by the probability of enforcement Bad and, and good in terms of suppression decision because it's more likely to get a bad type 
one evidence, right? And the good thing is it's more likely to have a good type um, type. Other thing that's blocked by blocked by the view panel. Um, add up to one, right? That's kind of a you know a neutral balance condition. Have greater incentive to. Lastly, again, it's possible that I will will suppress evidence. Papers in progress haven't fully analyzed that case. Have looked at it a little bit. All right. So you can think now, right? Well, with probability one half, there's going to be a private benefit. Right? If it decides to, you know, if we're going to allow suppression, and it has to exceed its cost of suppression, right? So that's going to be the. Well, also, half we have a good type firm. And also, the welfare action is. And the second one is always possible, right? So we're always going to want possible. Again, these are, you know, isn't one? Allowing, we're allowing to fight the fact that you suppressed, you still end up with a Would be either zero or one. The other alternative is we can try to prevent the test. That case is, is similar, except the question cost, right? Action if it's better than and the welfare again. And again, there's expected sanctions, so the structure of the model is such that the difference between the expected sanction when you suppress or not is when you can think of not suppressing is just having n equal to one, right? You just now, in this case, right, if we conditional on the fact that there isn't suppression, what you'd like to do as an enforcer, like to ever enforce when uh, the more accurate type evidence, type two, is good. And we want to always enforce when. And however, unless it's 
k is not really large, it's no surprise not going to be able to go all the other thing that's you know interesting to notice here is that these marginal effects turn out to be equal and Of the suppression. It's not that hard to depict suppression in which case uh, add type from suppression would be. And in that case, RGB all the way to one, we can always import, right? By um, RBG, right? We enforce more when you have a bad type one evidence, but a good type two evidence, which means that it's valuable to suppress that good type two evidence, the bad type two evidence, because you're more likely to get. A is the easiest expression for the less we have to distort. Accurate the first type of type's going to be binding, but now it's harder to deter suppression. Have to set all the way to one. Have to move that all the way to one. Have to deter suppression by. Depending on how large K is, so it's really. Accurate now, I'm just sort of focusing on the two and equal two. So you get Add, you're going to have to reveal the, the back. Out that you're always going to be. By the same amount, like up and down in this, in this thing. As me was not that effective, so in like this actually can improve as a accurate as as the Accurate non suppressible evidence. How's the evidence suppression?
but obviously um, how we enforce Not surprisingly, when they talk. Harder to deter, so we're going to. I have to deter suppression. Always enforcing when I not surprisingly, right? Hard, and you still end up with all bad types of To reduce our suppression. Because we don't like to incur that cost, and because we have extremely large. Going to want to deter them. I've done a little bit looking at what happens with only one type. Analysis said, yeah, that type of correct evidence is a good happen to stay pretty low. way too much. A lot of cases where that, that, that's what this model is. In that case, enforcers have the choice between deciding father ensuring the cost of depressing evidence happen and so what do we learn from from model? likely to be off. Problem when when some I uh, guess the last thing that I thought was a case where we're kind of just in different must generate more accuracy 
Not realizing about all right so that's uh mm -hmm. uh oh. yes sir after England. All right, good morning. Thank you all for coming. Thank you to the organizers for the invitation and a very, very special thank you for uh, to Professor Bugarin who taught me my very first game theory class here at uh, University of Brasilia many, many years ago. I will not say how many years ago, but it was a while ago. So a uh, special, special uh, uh, occasion for me to be back here home and with Professor Bugarin. So thank you so very much. So this is a joint work with John Matsusaka and uh, Chong Kyu. So people have money, they put their money on mutual funds and pension funds, and those in institutional investors acquire shares of many, many different companies. So they become shareholders of those different companies. And those companies, they have shareholder meetings, and we have to, shareholders have to vote on many different issues, many different proposals. So they have to vote on approving uh, people for board of directors, approving compensation of the CEO, approving mergers, uh, and approving more routine items as auditing companies and so on and so forth. Uh, so Vanguard, which is a very large uh, pension uh, fund, reported voting on 184,000 proposals just in 2022 alone uh, uh, with, within 13,000 different companies worldwide. So of course, Vanguard is an outlier because it is so big, but this number gives you some uh, idea of how many proposals those uh, investment funds, uh, institutional investors have to vote on. So we're talking about hundreds of different companies and thousands of different proposals that we have to vote on every year in a very short period of time. So most of the proposals have to be voted on within a three month window. So it is a very large cost for those institutional investors to get to just read and understand all those different thousands of proposals that they have to vote on. And by law in the United States since 2003, they have to vote. So those institutional investors, they are required not only to cast a vote, but they are required to be informed when casting a vote. They have to do their due diligence. So instead, sorry, instead of having a very big department doing research on all those proposals, what many of those institutional investors they can do, at least to help them, is that they can hire what's called a proxy advisor. So it's gonna be a company that the investor, the mutual fund, pays the company and the company is going to recommend approving or rejecting each one of those proposals. And then the investor with this information can approve or reject each proposal on uh, the ballot. 
So what happened in the U.S. is that the U.S. market consolidated basically with two companies, which are called ISS and Glass News, that those two companies just dominate the market and they are the ones giving uh, advice, approve or not, uh, or reject on each one of those proposals that we have to vote on. But that's what we want to understand. We want to understand this market where it's too costly for investors to get uh, informed about all those proposals. So they rely on those companies to provide advice, to sell advice to them such that they can vote on the proposal. And it's interesting, if you don't know, imagine casting on your computer thousands of votes. Just that is very costly, very cumbersome for those companies. So the proxy advisors here even sell a service that they vote for you. So you just say, okay, I delegate to you, give the information and just cast the ballot as whatever is your proposal and such that I have, I don't have to, have to do all that work. So the literature in finance about proxy advisors selling information, strategically selling information to those voters, basically we have four main papers and all of them consider a uh, monopoly market, only one seller of information. They consider a binary state. Each proposal is it either good or bad. And they all consider investors with a common goal in the sense that if the investors know that the proposal is good, they all would vote yes. If they know that they knew that the invest, uh, proposal is bad, they would all vote no. So there is no conflict of interest under full information. So we're gonna go beyond this literature and our theoretical contribution is gonna be, we're gonna consider competition between any firms. We're gonna consider a very rich state space where proposals are more complex than good or bad. And we're gonna consider investors who have different goals. So even if those institutional investors knew exactly what was written and understood the proposal, some of them would still disagree whether the proposal is a good or a bad thing from their point of view for the firm, okay? And this is gonna bring us actually close to our older literature in IO about firm location and price discrimination, and also a new literature on media competition. So let's, let me get started with the model. So a proposal is gonna be represented by a real number V, think about it as the value of the proposal, but it's the value of proposal J for investor I. So if the investor approves this proposal, the investor payoff is just a proposal. You get a payoff of V. If you reject the proposal, you get a payoff of minus V. So the investor wants to approve the proposal whenever the proposal is a positive number. The investor wants to reject the proposal whenever the proposal is a negative number. So being a negative number means bad, being a positive number being, means good. So we, you want to appro approve positive, reject negative. And of course, if V is close to zero, making a mistake, it's not a big deal because V is close to zero. It's a proposal that doesn't matter very much. If V is very large, making a mistake is very costly. Okay, so getting wrong whether we should not merge, for example, that's a big deal. It's gonna have a very big impact uh, on the firm. So this, if you understand this, you will understand everything about the model because that's where, what is V? So V is gonna have a proposal component and how much the shareholder cares about the proposal. So proposal now is a two dimensional object. A proposal has a social return S and a financial return R. So think about R as how, it's gonna, how this proposal is gonna directly affect the, pay, the uh, profit of the firm. So if R is a big positive number, it's very good for profit. If R is a negative number, it is bad for profit. And S is a social return. I'm putting here everything that's not directly profit. So you can think about, you know, is this proposal gonna increase pollution or the carbon footprint of the company or not? I can think about, many mutual funds are very concerned about the diversity of the board. So do I have a firm that already has 
uh, many white males as the board of the directors. And now you're proposing another white male for this board of director. I don't want it. I prefer to have a minority or is this board already diverse enough? And I don't, you know, it's not a problem of who we are indicating. So whatever is not finite, whatever is not profit, we're going to put here into social issue. What about the mutual funds? The mutual funds are different from each other in two dimensions. First, how much each mutual fund cares about the social issue relative to the financial issue. So that's captured by theta here. Theta is a number between, uh, theta is going to be a number between zero and one, which is how much weight do I put as an investor on the social issue relative to the financial issue. So this is a horizontal differentiation. Am I a mutual fund that cares a lot about the social dimension of the proposals or am I a mutual fund that cares less? I'm more concerned with profit itself. The vertical dimension is going to be lambda. Lambda is a positive number, which is going to capture how much the mutual fund cares about voting correctly. So think about in California, think about the CalPERS, which is the a uh, pension plan for the civil servants of California. It is a huge um, uh, pension plan. It is very concerned about how it is voting. It is scrutinized by the media. It is scrutinized by the unions, civil servant unions in California. So they are very concerned about voting right, about doing the right thing, about voting yes when the proposal should be approved, voting no when the proposal should be rejected. Now contrast that with a passive mutual fund that only cares about tracking the S&P 500 index. The investors really don't care how you're voting. I care about the return that your fund is providing to me. I'm not as concerned about the tracking record of that particular fund. So again, those two different dimensions for mutual funds, that's how they are different, how much they care about social issue and how much they care about voting correctly in the first place. So, there's going to be a distribution, a smooth distribution, which is going to say how, what are the characteristics of the mutual funds. There is going to be a smooth distribution. It's going to say, what's the distribution of proposals? So we have thousands and thousands of proposals. What's the distribution of social return and financial return? Just to simplify my life, I'm going to think that on average, social return and the financial return are zero in those proposals, just to simplify my life. And in our benchmark version, investors cannot directly learn about the proposal. It's too many, too expensive. So they're going to have to buy information from those proxy advisors in order to learn what the proxy advisor's recommendation in order to vote. So what is an advice? An advice is going to be, advice policy is going to be characterized by a number alpha between zero and one which is simply how much weight the proxy advisor is going to put on a social issue. So the proxy advisor needs to evaluate thousands of items and is going to say, okay, for each item, if this is positive, I'm going to approve. If this is negative, if the return is negative, I'm going to reject it. So I'm computing the return using this much weight on the social issue. So if I put alpha of zero, I will only look at the financial return and I'm gonna say whether the financial return is positive or negative. If alpha is one, it's the opposite. I only look at the social return. And if alpha is anything between, is something between that I'm doing. So yes. So on my baseline model is one advice to everyone. If it is two advice, those are two different products that I'm selling. And we have an extension where I allow you to sell multiple products. So think about if I have two products, it is going to be the same in equilibrium as two different firms doing two different advices. The thing is, it is very costly for every time I set up a advice. That's a group of researchers that I need to have there. It is a policy of how I'm generating information. So it's basically a new firm that I have just to run that. So CNN is not giving the same advice as Fox News. You need a different team to be able to give this particular policy advice, 
okay, like-minded people to go and research and have some methodology to, the, to do that. But think about two different advices as being two different things. So if we think about the investor, the investor only needs to know if this thing, if this return is positive or negative. I don't need to know exactly the return. I only need to know it is positive, so I should vote yes, or is negative, I should vote no. So from the point of view of the investor, if I'm an investor theta, I want a policy alpha, which equals to my theta. That's my optimal policy. Any alpha that's further away from my theta is a, uh, a advice that's valuable, but it's not as much valuable because it doesn't match my preference. So the cool thing is, you can, if you can see it, that's why I was mentioned the IO literature, because this basically becomes very similar to a Hockley model of location. My location as a uh, investor buying information is I want information equals to theta. I want this policy to be equal to theta. That's my position. Any policy that's away from theta is a policy that's less valuable for me. Approve or reject. So I'm really thinking about real life where if even if you, in real life, they give you a report, you're not going to read the report. You're talking about, you have to vote, vote in 10,000 different items. You're not going to be reading out the report. You're going to just see approve and reject, and you're going to click approve and reject for that. So that's the costly, and that's what it makes it different from the media literature. For example, when you're voting for the president of the United States, I want, I have time. I want to know the details to think about what is that. When I'm voting, voting 10,000 different items, I just want the basis. Is it approved or reject? And then we go from there. All right. So uh, what's the timing of the model? What's the timing of the model? The competitors announce the policies. They all announce the policy at the same time. Then they engage in a Bertrand competition. And what's different than the uh, traditional hotline model is price discrimination. So I know if you are a big mutual fund or smaller, so I'm going to charge you a particular price for you because I know who you are. So you have price discrimination, and then each investor chooses which advice to buy, and then we vote accordingly. So let's go uh, two measures of what's important here. We're going to measure what's the total utility, how happy those investors are voting, and we're going to measure how close the voting outcome is to total in to full information. So under full information, whatever the median voter says is what happens because it's the median voter. So under full information, the decision should match the median voter. So let's see what happens in equilibrium. In equilibrium, if I have a monopolist, the monopolist is going to give an advice that targets the average voter, not the median voter, where average is weighted by how much those investors care about voting correctly. So this actually maximizes voting utility. So the advisor is selling information, trying to make you happy. So targets the average voter, makes the average voter really happy. But if the average voter is not the median voter, we have a distortion. Intercommons. So the outcomes are not the same outcome as if we had full information. So in particular, if I have a distribution of preferences where many mutual funds care a lot about the financial return and few uh, mutual funds care about social return, the advice is going to be biased towards the social return because I'm going to make a higher profit out of that. And especially if uh, left-wing funds, funds that care a lot about social return, also care a lot about voting correctly, then this covariance is going to be positive and this bias is going to be even greater. Does having competition helps or not? So what competition is going to do is instead of having one advice, there's going to be two advice, a more advice, one, one advice to the left, one advice to the right, those companies are going to segment the market, but within each market segment, they are still targeting the average voter. So I target the average voter in my segment, the other company targets the average voter in the other segment. 
this is good. This product differentiation is good for voting utility, but might not be good for corporate governance. Here, we start with a monopolist that's far away from the median. Competition is good. But if I start with a monopolist that's very close to the median, competition is bad. So whether or not competition is going to be good or bad for governance really depends on where we started. In the limit, as we have more and more firms, we are just creating more and more and more market segments. So under perfect competition, we have full information. So perfect competition is good because it maximizes voting utility and it maximizes governance because we have the median, the median uh, outcome. So I'm, I'm, do I have one minute or I'm out of time. So let's just finish with one extreme, my last slide, one extension of the model. What happens if some mutual funds have private information? So some big mutual funds in particular or very active hedge funds, they are doing research on the market because they want to make money. And as a byproduct of that uh, uh, research, they learn about those proposals. So they are already informed about those proposals while a bunch of other mutual funds are not informed. So when the government forces all those mutual funds to buy information to actually vote, what it's doing now, it is biasing the outcome in the direction of the proposal that uh, of the advice that's given by the proxy advisor, which is not representing the median voter, is representing the average voter because I want to maximize my profit. So profit maximizes on the average, not on the median. So it's a tale of caution here uh, uh, to this um, uh, US law of saying, you have to vote, but voting is very costly to vote in form, and it's much cheaper for me to buy information than to get information myself, but the information that I'm buying is not representing me, it's representing some average, which is not that medium, and that can uh, make governance of those firms even worse. So that's, uh, I stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for guiding for this invitation. Uh, I don't have math exercise here, but some sorry for you. <laughs> and uh, actually, I was invited to uh, think a little bit about uh, this initiative in Brazil, trying to imitate European uh, DMA Digital Market Act, and. Uh, uh, they told me that uh, we were uh, discussing it in economic basis and political basis, but we are not. We were not uh, trying to understand it, our constitution. So this is my work. I tried to understand this, to, to understand understand this uh, uh, big tech regulation. 
try to understand why this is yeah. happening all over the world. Try to understand the DMA, the Digital Market Act uh, from uh, European Union. And try to see if there is uh, actually uh, economic and uh, political reasons uh, that justifies it. But uh, we were uh, forgetting about the detail that was our constitution and if it's possible to do the same as Europeans are doing there. So um, big tech uh, regulation seems now uh, a global obsession. Everybody's worried about them. I really don't understand this movement. Uh, seems like we are worried about uh, being big again. And this seems to be a little bit outdated in competition. Uh, so, not so uh, competition uh, way of thinking, but uh, it seems to be really a global uh, obsession now. And uh, actually, Europe was the first one to give the the most important uh, step towards this towards this kind of uh, regulation that is really different from what we were doing to now. Uh, here in Brazil, we have this. Project to lay to to that seems to be a little uh, Brazilian DMA wannabe, and uh, it imitates really imitates um, DMA. And the the question is, uh, is this uh, really uh, um, really an option for us? Uh, is the the is it the the pale in such may to exactly something we should do. And to think about it, we need to face facts and face and understand the European solution. So uh, actually we can see that technological innovation is moving ahead vigorously. And I think this is a good news. Actually, uh, innovation brings together uh, progress and we need it, we need it uh, in Brazil. Uh, and we can also see that over the last 150 years, the world has seen companies with a significant market share. Uh, we can think about Standard Oil, for instance, and this is not exactly a novelty for us, and even for Europe or the United States. But we can see uh, standard authorities are maybe uh, really motivated to act like, uh, oh, uh, let me show who's the boss here, who must be the, the big here. And in other, in the other, on the other hand, we can see academia a little bit frustrated, like, uh, oh, they are too big to us. Uh, we should do something. And um, the solution European has given, uh, it was to enforce that uh, kind of uh, discipline uh, to gatekeepers, and they nominated it. This is strange. They nominated Alphabet, Amazon, Apple, and ByteDance, Meta, and Microsoft as if they were something really uh, huge, too, too huge to uh, to exist. Uh, we need to, to see that actually uh, there are not uh, European companies there in this list. And even um, we, we don't have uh, Brazilian companies there. Um, this DMA, this Digital Market Act, uh, it defines big techs based on qualitative criteria, but the size is the most important or seems to be the most important. And as I told you, for me, this, this is a kind of outdated idea. This is something that uh, was in 1960s. And I can't understand this coming back again, but okay, yeah, it was their choice. And it also modifies the antitrust treatment given, and it uh, prefers an ex um, obligations and an asymmetric obligation to be uh, to them to fulfill. Uh, the, the question is, okay, we try to imitate it. Um, and our project today also do the same. They, they are uh, worried about uh, size and defining excellent obligations, but uh, why should we do this? We can see discussions on political basis. Oh, everybody's doing so. We do. We, we must do it too. 
And we can see lots of uh, economic reasoning uh, trying to explain this movement, like, oh, they have economic power, they have those self-referencing clauses, they have uh, problems on um, dominance, but this is not new, this is not a novelty, and this is being uh, related as reasons to do, and we can see lots of economic uh, papers uh, dealing with this uh, question. But the problem is our constitution needs to uh, authorize it. And we should uh, see if it does. Uh, seems to me that we are lost in political and economic reasons. Uh, if we see, for example, uh, that uh, the Brazilian legal system does not authorize discriminatory treatment between economic agencies. And these agents, and this can, this is literally in law, uh, the freedom law, our Lei de Liberdade Econômica. We can also see in the, in the Constitution that uh, economic power and its size cannot be considered uh, uh, illegal uh, per se. And uh, the abuse of economic power must be analyzed based on its capacity to cause damage to the community as the law, the, our antitrust law establishes. So it seems to me that um, this movement Europe is doing is more related to uh, that intention they have to create an unity there. And this is not a reason for us to, to do something. Um, we have a different uh, situation. And it, it seems to me that our real problem, our, our main problem is innovation. And I'm really worried about imitating this kind of legal movement and uh, against our constitution and the worst, against uh, the possibility of uh, permitting or creating an, an environment that can uh, make possible to innovate. So it's this. Thank you. Uh, we have 15 minutes, so if uh, anyone um, has open. Thank you to... Because I'm sorry if uh, it's not very precisely, but... company and that will have negative impact over society. Working to build tax base and you're saying work it quite well, but However, if, if it is very good, I guess, I think it's both scenarios are possible. And the second uh, question for you. At the capacity of the regulators to act with special evidence, right? Thank you. To this question, fact is sorry on the same thing. Oh, 
oggi non so che sono fatti con le gambe. Okay, um, yeah, thanks, Alvaro. Um, so, yeah, in, in terms of the, the independent, the assumption of the independence of private benefits to social welfare, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I completely agree. You can easily imagine correlations going in either direction. Um, you know, and I, I'd like to consider both of those. It's, you know, it does complicate things quite a bit because you have to consider the you know instead of just being able to take the same welfare when there's action no matter what right you have to consider like it, it's that the right so in that case the l would be related to the private benefits and that's what makes it substantially you know more complicated which is why i've sort of started with this with this baseline case it's not so much that the l is the same whether it's good or bad it's more that it's independent of uh, you know so I, that i think you're right that that is like what i think is you know at this point the most restrictive assumption i think it's fairly straightforward kind of what would be different if we have different magnitudes of l but i think the the correlation i think you're absolutely right um you know might produce uh something different in in each of these cases and yeah i think there's it's easy to imagine situations where that correlation goes in in either direction um in, in terms of the capacity for the regulator to observe whether there's evidence suppression, in the way the model is structured right now, that doesn't matter because it's a commitment model and you commit to a policy that you know either produces it or not. So it doesn't really matter whether you observe it because you know what's going to happen, right? In a different, in a model without commitment, right, where you know, there was some imperfect, you know, if you're thinking like it's observable maybe, but not verifiable, so you can't punish based on it, right? You know, yeah, that would be, that would be interesting to, to look at, um, but it's a, it's a different model. It's sort of, you know, it, it matters in a non-commitment model where the enforcement decisions in some sense, you know, come after the decision to suppress. Here, the, the enforcement policy is set in advance and so whether or not you could observe it or not, you still have sort of committed to these, um, to this enforcement. So let me first clarify that when, when I mentioned four papers, were the four papers that have like pure theory on a more general uh, abstract market of selling, strategic selling information, but there are a ton of papers on empirics. Uh, my co-authors have several papers on empirics of uh, those advice and particular points of those advice. And exactly this empirical literature that got us to try to uh, look at heterogeneity here. And I absolutely agree with you. One of the problems that we get there is a lot, to make it cheaper for me to analyze those proposals is I have this thing that's multidimensional and I'm boiling, boiling down to a few items where I'm checking the box of, uh, is this true or this is not? So I, we don't have this in the model, but you can think about the model as having many more dimensions, but I'm only looking at two dimensions of that model. Uh, the example that I gave was a true example where many times to give advice for board of director, just counting how many people are in certain categories and they have, you know, they have standards that you have to have to uh, uh have a new board of director and they're just checking those boxes, which creates all sort of problems. Not only sort of problems where I have a more complex problem and I only look at few dimensions of that problem, but I'm even more concerned about the endogenous proposals that you get in the first place. So if I were to say what's my what would be my favorite follow-up paper for this one is given that proxy advisors have this very particular and narrow policy of giving yes or no recommendations, what are the proposals that are being proposed in the first place from the shareholders themselves and from the CEO of the companies? So I do, I, I'm extremely concerned with the narrow of a view of what's going on to make it cheaper to, to analyze those proposals and what are proposals that's coming up. In the Not on the model, but I think those are two
the question about the mutual fund paper and and changes of kind of a voting model, buying information model. I didn't know why the median. Care a lot, uh, which it seems like what's going on. And, and I think that's the most fundamental questions that, that we want to make up front of the paper and actually raise that question because the SEC and we as a society, are we thinking about that question in the first place? Because what's the benchmark that we are raising here? The benchmark is under full information, one share, one vote, the median voter outcome should be there. So why, you know, the benchmark is, I give you full information about the proposals. We follow the law, which is simple majority voting of shareholders, one share, one vote. The outcome should be the median voter. Even though some people are winning, you know, it's the same thing. I say, let's vote for who's going to be the next president of Brazil. 6% of people want this guy, 40% want the other guy. But the 40% that wanted the other guy really, really, really want the other guy. Should we not have a democracy? You know, what, what's a democracy in the first place? What's a shareholder democracy in the first place? I'm not saying I have the final answer here. I'm just, I think we're just raising that question. And it's going to be a big part of the paper, just a debate of what, what is to, to, to think. Like, personally, and my co my co-authors agree with us, is like, our view of democracy, of shareholder democracy, is one share, one vote. So the outcome should reflect on the median voters. Should not, you know, how do I intensify preferences here? And if you really, really, really want something to happen, buy more shares. That, that, would, be, that would be the idea here. So, you know, in real life, I cannot buy more votes, or at least it's illegal for me to buy more votes for president. But here, you should be able to buy more shares if you really, really care. It's a, it's a crucial point. And, and I, I think that the finance literature is not thinking about that enough. And that's why you know, we want to bring up that question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure if I uh, I know exactly what kind of problem you are looking at, but uh, one thing that I was thinking during the, your presentation, you know, in this uh, discovery, you have uh, uh, two parties, and one party can kind of uh, uh, challenge what you are uh, forming, right? So one 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 question that was in the back of my mind is someone can challenge uh, the, the the guy that provides information, and if there is suppression and they go after, and they can be punished for the suppression. So it'd be a different kind of model, but uh, closer to be closer to reality, punishment, suppression. Yeah. So I think if. If suppression is observable and verifiable, the problem is is simpler, right? In the sense that you could just have sufficient punishments for it and deter it that way, right? So, so I agree. I, I'm sort of considering the case where, you know, it's that's not really, you know, that's not really possible, right? So certainly in like the merger context, it's very hard to know, you know, whether or not like the company, you know. That, you know, first of all, what are they giving you all the documents that they really have? Have they deleted some? Right. That's you know, there's some chance maybe they that could be revealed. At some point. I think it's even harder to say. And it's not even clear that it's a file. It's not even clear it would be illegal. Right. If the company will tell, tell people don't talk about this over email. Right. Um, you know, that is would lead to evidence suppression potentially but it's not clear that that's actually you know obviously destroying documents would be illegal suggesting you don't create them in the first place 
I think might, you know, would probably not be illegal and, and certainly would not be punishable, I, I, you know, in most cases. But yeah, if you can punish it and, you know, punish it sufficiently a large amount, you, then you can deter it without distorting your, your enforcement. Thank you. Uh, we have a cough break now. Professor Abraham. Um,
Entro.
ready. And a flat wage is for everyone. And those don't seem like this. After some of the motivation of this, salary history bands are. are states and cities have an app. Half salary, um, a voluntary disclosure practice. Um, probably you can make voluntary disclosure. Double. Um, and these things are pretty serious. Hey, okay. uh, here's an example of something. From Um, but what are these supposed to do? And here they're they're kind enough to follow. Now this model we're not going to look at the same. Way. Oh. Um, uh, uh, have to, if you're advertising a job, you have to post the salary range. Uh, this is the uh, salary that the pay. Um, you know, California Commission on the Sale. Box step pay. Have a court decision. That's saying actually our new rule. Box step pay compensation. Happening certainly in the United States. Actually, I'm missing the pay as well. Types of standard models. Time from one is a symmetric model. Uh, kind of know what their abilities are. Uh, and the wage results in that case from the bidding war. Of the signal, not only from that. But we end up tweaking our model. Uh, and in this case, there's a quality signal that goes from the incumbent firm. So that's where we go. Outsider can only observe something. Play uh, the, the level alignment and a, a higher than beta prime is observable. What this means then is that the incumbent 
and poaching of high quality. Signals can be or if you ban competition, you'd be improving efficiency. And wage disclosure would be totally irrelevant in these models. Right? Oh. All right, so what we've done is alpha. Uh, Air, uh, the the outside firm observed some signal, right? And, and Eric, or general, on what that is. Uh, and then in place, jobs based on the outside firm. The, uh, the only other thing I'll mention technical discussion of the one thing that we're going to see is that we are individually observable. The outside firm can always come in and make it. Other, the other concept that we're going to have well, in our model, we have costly effort, uh, which is great. that means that you're going to have. Makes them easier to post. So the generic model. Said, uh, we have the. I, I apologize. I had this animated. Did we have the incumbent firm? Action is in this case, Alpha has observed the skill level, the employee has also observed. The
transparent. Because is that it means that if the outside firm observes the after motion signal green. Observe that promotion and infer that this is and then they build up. Okay. Right. And so this is oh, um, so keep all the time. Uh, this is in a size. And again, what we would get out of this is this is. Page disclosure in this model. Um, this is our main result. Now for the What that does, all of a sudden, and based on those two living pages among different highest skill employees. That's that's essentially what we're doing. That, uh, and then when you have one to one correspondence page, you can just make that. That's the that's the least good. At full efficiency, you get more. Talked about, but uh, so this, this is and under a salary history, then, but what has changed uh, have cost the effort, uh, but. Uh, um, motion, um, essentially we have salary compression. So if you ask, age inequality, you know, is yes. Yes. Um, and yeah. And again, note that if we were, uh, we could have. Uh, better, we get rid of this. It is uh, in effect. Oh, we'd have, we'd have an efficiency. Um, and then we consider an equality mandate. So if you recall, when we talked about that, A within a within a thing. Um, so what happens under an equality mandate? Um, we actually do now have pooling as a sustainable. What that means is that when you can president, all vice presidents. Um, and what that means then is that it, it that being paid the same
equality vice president uh, you would have to pay them more but you can't because by construction we're pooling that under promotion of the high actually going to have to have over cases will have over promotion technical uh, in general salaries are lower and we've, we've mandated efficiency mandated uh, uh, equality, so we have wage equality. Again, one thing that's kind of interesting about this, is that we haven't modeled this, but it would say. So in conclusion, what we've done is I think we have put in a Ages become integral to production, they become fully informative. It allows us to type of reforms that seek to have this. We'll go back to our uh, well, so that's an extension. Of it. Um, but in general, what should we observe with these policies? Capital, we're going to see salary compression, so we will see lower inequality. Back to some sort of strategic. Have questions at the end. At the end. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. First of all, I'm grateful for the opportunity. I'm probably there. To my colleagues from the University of High School of the Thank you.
So, uh, Terms of institutional agreement. It's real. The market Users of uh, platforms deployed mm -hmm. in the field. But at the same time, they established by the platform. Choosing between alternative. Let me remind you that here at OM, you need to find a counterpart. platforms
Yeah, you know what? Those hypotheses is related. is actually a For
full of transactions, right? Yeah. It just starts me. He is actually after. Different in the table. Is that with the other? So, label freedom. He's in the level of the individual. The variable. If you look at the color, very statistically significant, but for the Little evidence and People the regulation. And the empirically we can from
What is interesting? I can't see the difference. Regulation on the market. I'd like to thank uh, the organizers for the opportunity to be part of this terrific conference. This paper is part of a broader project, Frankly, Davis from NYU. We are organizing a book rally among legal heterodoxy in the global south, focusing on various areas of private law. Uh, installment in particular. Why don't I have the real microphone? Thank you. Is it on? Yes. Thank you. Um, and, and this project in particular relates to the current debate uh, in the United States about the role of stakeholders and social in comparative governance. It's just striking to me that Audulon's paper had an S function together with the F function. I think 10 years ago, we wouldn't have um, that. Um, so, so this paper engages with the literature on uh, comparative corporate law and governance. That, that's what I do. Um, the, the Global South generally is understudied, but if you think about uh, the general perception about corporate law in the Global South is that it is antiquated, it is subject to failed foreign transplant, uh, it is perhaps uh, in some cases perfectly adequate on the books, but subject to various problems of enforcement. And there's China, and China, of course, is the subject of a growing literature, and uh, scholars have noted that China in particular has the world's most 
stakeholder oriented uh, system of corporate governance. I would like to say in this project, there is something to this view. I don't think it is entirely fake views, so inaccurate in all circumstances, but that there is more to corporate law in the global south than, that, than has been captured by the literature so far. So this project aims to contribute with a different picture. And, and that is uh, global south jurisdictions as pioneers in heterodox stakeholderism. This is a new picture, not because there are no studies involving global south jurisdictions, of course there are, but the, the way the literature usually proceeds is that there are certain metrics or boxes based on the problems and experiences in the global north. And then you go to look at global south jurisdictions based on the lenses and you only see what you're looking for. So here I'm not trying to look at derivative actions or um, certain dimensions of insider trading global south, but I'm Try, I'm specifically looking for uh, differences that are usually not captured by the standard approach. So by heterodox stakeholderism, I mean approaches that are on the one hand distinct from those in the global north, and on the other hand, distinct in a certain sense is that they appear to adopt a broader focus on externalities and inequality, something that I've called in prior works a policy community through corporate law and corporations. So this project documents a varieties of heterodox stakeholderism in the global south. So first I'll go through those uh, manifestations and then I'll offer an explanation about what is going on, an interpretation about what is going on. First you have the erosion of limited liability for the benefit of stakeholders in Brazil, also in India and other global south jurisdictions. We have emerging legislation mandating CSR spending. You see it in India, Mauritius, Indonesia. We have also legislation mandating CSR committees in corporations. You see that in South Africa, in India. You have measures of stakeholder empowerment in corporate law, such as the ability of workers and unions to file derivative suit and even file for bankruptcy protection. There are various measures for promoting racial and ethnic diversity in corporate governance in Malaysia and South Africa. And there's also a stakeholders orientation, national uh, constitutions. Well, this, this was interesting, Amanda was talking before how Braz the Brazilian constitution imposes limits on regulations and, and that is true, but our constitution is, is very much um, very large and has all sorts of social rights and and one of um one of the themes here is that to what extent there is a stakeholder orientation relating to corporate law in those this one is a big in the brazilian context which is the erosion of limited liability limited liability is deemed by many to be most important most paradigmatic um, attribute of the corporation and it has been eroded drastically in Brazil um, over the years, especially in the last uh, 20 or, or 30 years. It has been effectively eliminated in labor law or employment law, consumer protection, environmental law, and also in financial uh, regulation to a significant extent. So this is one example of the type of provision you find in Brazil. Um, I'm quoting the one in the environmental law statute. There's a similar one in the consumer law statute. Veil piercing may apply whenever legal personality is an obstacle to the compensation of harms caused to the quality of the environment. So whenever legal personality could be useful in shielding one from liability, then veil piercing is applied. This is a very broad concept and it is um, applied by, by, by Brazilian courts. And it's interesting that the, the scenarios in which you have mitigation of limited liability in Brazil are especially scenarios for purposes of stakeholder protection. So that the, that type of mitigation does not uh, necessarily apply in the context of commercial creditors, in, in which case we have a more rigorous test. Interestingly, you have 
erosion of limited liability in other jurisdictions of the global uh, South as well. India became a famous case in the literature for embracing unlimited liability of parent companies after a major environmental human rights uh, disaster. It was done through courts. Um, Colombia also has a famous uh, case involving the imposition of parent company liability in a case involving pensioners. Now I'm switching to number two, which is mandatory CSR spending. A very famous um, rule is that is the one India adopted in 2013, requiring companies to devote 2% of their profits to CSR initiatives. Um, that was initially done on a comply or explain basis. Now it is fully ma mandatory. Um, it was justified as responding for a need of perception correction at a time of big division in the country as the divide between the rich and the poor was getting bigger and bigger. And the concept of CSR is very broad. So things that you do for, for your employees in order perhaps to improve their well-being and performance are not considered CSR. But broad objectives such as fighting poverty, extreme hunger, child mortality, HIV, that's all within uh, the, the scope of the statute. So but CSR uh, in, in India is not alone. You also had it in, in Mauritius, Indonesia. Another dimension is that of CSR committees. By the way, now, I mean, now uh, later, uh, CSR or ESG committees are booming in the United States, but they have, but that development has been preceded by mandates of CSR committees in global South jurisdictions. So you first saw that in the South Africa Companies Act of 2008 and later in the India's Companies Act of 2013. Uh, another uh, manifestation is stakeholder empowerment relating to the rights workers have in corporate governance in South, South Africa, which I mentioned before. Uh, interestingly, when we think about stakeholder empowerment in the global north, the paradigmatic example is employee representation on company boards, which is a famous feature of the German system. That type of mechanism is very rare in the global south, but um, South Africa in particular has granted other uh, expensive rights to employees in corporate governance. There's also the issue of uh, diversity in corporate governance, specifically in connection with racial justice. In the corporate governance literature, it's common to speak of Norway as the country that innovated with a law mandating gender quotas in corporate governance. But if you're gonna think about racial diversity rather than gender diversity, then it is Global South jurisdictions that had a leading role. When Mandela was just out of prison in 1990s, he made a statement saying that uh, in South Africa at the time, less than 10 conglomerates controlled almost 90% of the shares in the Johannesburg Stock Exchange and directors were almost all white male. And that issue now is in, is in the US. It was, it was the type of example that, that um, Dillon chose as um, uh, describing the, the current case based in the United States. Uh, and, and, and in that context, uh, Mandela uh, described the imperative to end white domination in all forms and deracialize the exercise of economic power. So initially there were um, there was a program called uh, Black Economic Empowerment, and the primary concern was to transfer shares to black people because most businesses were white were white owned. Uh, mostly there were voluntary transactions uh, promoted by the state, and they led to the transfer of shares to black people. But those were politically connected black people. And that created some concerns about cronism. In view of that, in 2003, there's this, a new statute was enacted in South Africa called the BBBEE, -E, Broad Based Black Economic Empowerment, which has a scorecard of various metrics relating to, to black inclusion, 
which cover not only black ownership of shares, but also black membership in uh, boards of directors, uh, training for employees, procurement of black firms. And that system has led uh, to multiple carrots administered by the state. Um, and the perception is that those requirements actually trickle down the supply chain in South Africa. Uh, as of 2021, there are 99% black executive directors, 27% black directors, and 29% black ownership, which looks very disappointing um, to the South African people, but still compares highly favorably um, uh, to Brazil. A, a recent study in 2022 found 0% um, black directors in Brazil, though, though after that now is, is slowly changing. Even before South Africa, Malaysia had a, ve had a very aggressive policy of diversity or affirmative action in corporate governance to favor um, own ownership by the local Malays or Bumiputera um, population. And again, it was disappointing, but it did increase significantly the share of a corporate ownership by the Bumiputera. We also see signs of stakeholderism in the constitutions of Global South jurisdictions. And I looked in, so, so I could have looked for the social function of property, but I tried to do something more tailored and, and, and looking at provisions that are more closely related to, to companies and corporate governance. So I mapped um, references to uh, cooperatives in the Global South and the Global North. So you see references in a seven a Global South constitutions. I'm here comparing the top 10 largest Global North jurisdictions uh, by GDP to the top 10 Global South jurisdictions by GDP. So we have, you see greater references to cooperatives. They're greater in, in aggregate, in the aggregate, and, and, and the numbers are quite striking. There are more than a hundred provisions on cooperatives in the Indian constitution. And I've also mapped um, references to workers profit sharing in corporations. So you see four such references in global south constitutions, uh, zero references in global north constitutions. It's quite common for corporate laws, uh, uh, corporate law reforms and bankruptcy law reforms to be the subject of constitutional challenges in the Global South. Um, and, and then there is the question of why is it that um, we see that the form of heterodox stakeholderism uh, in the Global South. So one interpretation is that challenges of state capacity and inequality put pressure on what I have called the modularity approach to law and economics. The modularity approach to law and economics is the standard approach to law and economics, according to which each area of law should have a narrow objective, it should contribute to efficiency in a given way. So for corporate law, it would be the reduction of agency costs, for antitrust law, it would be uh, consumer welfare. For bankruptcy law, it would be to maximize the value of the corporation for the benefit of creditors, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, that modular approach based on functional um, specialization becomes challenged uh, or faces a stronger challenge if economic problems rise and there is a perception that other areas of law are not doing their job. Suppose there is a perception that environmental law is not adequately um, tackling climate change, or that the tax and transfer system is not adequately tackling uh, distribution. Then there are pressure. There is pressure on other areas of law. So we heard about that also. I I, I was unaware about the developments in uh, employment law about not sharing salary history, but that is that is responding uh, po possibly to this problem that, that rely on the tax and transfer system alone has been uh, insufficient. 
And guess what? The perception that other areas of law are not doing their job and concerns about high inequality have been uh, longstanding in the global south. So this um, raises food for thought regarding the evolution of corporate law. I was telling some of you, I, uh, my JSD was advised by Henry Hansman, who together with Bernier Crockman became very famous for, um, for their theory on the end of history of corporate law. When they wrote, um, there, were, there were and still are two paradigms in the literature about how is it corporate law is going to evolve. And some people argue that there would be convergence being the end of history of corporate law. Fairholder wealth maximization would, would be the norm, not only in the US and the UK, but around the globe. And there are other people who said not so fast. There's path dependence, there are local conditions, so we are gonna get a lot of a persistence of existing differences. And here I'm suggesting uh, a different view, which is not a view of convergence to the, to the extent that that meant that the global south would look more like the global north, that was the prediction, but rather the opposite, with the global north looking increasingly like. Pakhan, uh, why? Um, the corporate law literature as the law and economics literature in general, though um, there, there are peculiarities here, has not focused on uh, distribution or geographical boundaries. I, I was thinking about that in listening to Amanda's presentation about whether different jurisdictions have different interests, whether the welfare calculus should not be global, but it should be jurisdiction specific, should be or, or, or even is because people vote locally. And, and here, there's an interesting contrast between corporate law and other areas of law. For instance, in IEP, there is this view that, for instance, strong patent protection might be optimal for the global north, but not for the global south, because the beneficiaries of IP protection are in the global north. And, and here I'm raising the possibility that at least some features of corporate law have that dimension, that gains might be restricted in one area and, and, and losses on the other. And I stress that is the case concerning uh, parent company liability. It is the case in many of those cases, the parent company and its shareholders are in the global north. The victims are in the global south. So maybe that helps explain why global south jurisdictions have been faster in eliminated parent company liability, even though the vast majority of law and economic scholars who have studied the topic defend parent company liability for kids. So the conclusion really here, uh, I'm not uh, defending the heterodoxies from, from a normative perspective. I'm not criticizing them either, but I'm rather arguing really for the payoffs of including global South jurisdictions into the study of comparative corporate law. Um, it challenges what can be called the world series syndrome, which is drawing generalizations about the world based on a handful of jurisdictions. And it also challenges what I have called the odd duck syndrome, because currently the literature only analyzes global South jurisdictions based on the lenses of the global North or in isolation compared to the global North. And that has led people to say, wow, the system of parent company liability in India is unique, exceptional. And I would say, well, welcome, welcome to Brazil. I'll, I'll, I'll teach you a bit about Brazilian corporate law. So I think there's a lot to be gained because there, there are unnoticed uh, commonalities between those institutional developments, which in turn, I argue, are driven by similarities in the underlying institutional conditions. And we're now open for questions.
how that would change and also if there's a possibility. I think your, your 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 question about the promotion and usage. So it's you know, technically in the in the literature, the promotion is if you're over the threshold, and then assignment is, is that beta, right? And time that's a promotion. But um, yeah, I mean, you're you're. I, I think the point you're getting at is that you know, in in the model, every every employee is providing a unit of labor, so you know, time that you have to show up and then. For everyone, I mean, I, I think um, there's there's sort of two responses to that. One is that this makes uh, productivity more expensive, right? And I think in in general terms, you think that probably more production probably does require more effort. And then sort of the way I think of conceptualizing it would sort of be like, yeah, you know, you have the you you do have the the vice president that. Um, maybe hold the title, but you know we know that that person's in kind of incompetent, so we don't we don't give them. And then somebody else has a whole bunch of things that that, that keep her up late at night. Um, and you would have to pay people. You would have to pay people more for that at, at the end of the day. Right? And, and and that's I think what we're trying to trying to capture. Yes, absolutely. I, I was even wondering what made you think that that wasn't part of my account. I think that's that's exactly um, the case in, in, in many of those um, in many of those examples. So, for instance, when when India imposed a two percent uh, mandate for purposes of CSR, one interpretation is like, why, why don't you tax what Indian state? Why don't you impose then a two percent tax and then spend it? And part of the justification or interpretation is that, well, because the state has huge problems advancing the social welfare, maybe maybe um, corporations will be in a better position to do the spending instead of the state. Uh, another interesting example relates to uh, the mitigation of liability for financial institutions in Brazil. Uh, one interpretation is that Brazilian regulators recognize how hard it is to regulate financial institutions, challenges involved, and they instead prefer to adopt a liability strategy. And instead of saying exactly what it should or shouldn't do, they impose liability and manage the shareholders if the if the if the um, if the institutions goes go bust. Uh, we we are not made, however. So this is one interpretation, and there's another interpretation, which is all of those instances of heterodox stakeholderism are distractions. So you can claim to be doing something and be actually doing nothing and preserving the status quo. And, and our account does not distinguish between the smoke screen interpretation of this or the functional uh, interpretation of this. But, but, that, but that, the fact that this strategy could be um, a deliberate policy strategy is, is, is very much um, what we have in mind. So we don't discard we don't argue that that's necessarily the case and that it works and it's functional we also leave open the possibility that you have this this as a strategy of, of appeasement rather than um uh, unnecessary solutions to the problems that they see
uh, which is uh, Oh, that's a good. That's a good point. We'll we'll, we'll look at that for sure. Yeah, thank you. I, uh, we we haven't really looked at it. I mean, I, I think uh, expect to see, like, given that this worked out. I probably, I probably shouldn't say much about this then, if I if I if I'm predicting something found one way or another. But uh, um, you know, we would expect that. Well, one thing it does is it tells you which models. Right? Typical testing that's out there. Folks are testing between symmetric learning. Yeah, very different. For us, I think we, we would see that competition would be bad for wages. Uh, out of the classic models, we don't. We just, Also important on terms of marketing because if I'm taxing the firm two percent and that the politician is the one handing out the food stamps to poor people, the politician says, "Hey, I'm the good guy. I'm handing out food, and the company is not gaining anything." So it's hard for the companies are gonna go against the firm saying, "I don't want to pay that." But when I ask the company, "No, you go and you hand out the food stamps," now the consumers, the company can say to its consumers. I'm a conscious company. I'm very nice. I'm giving that 2%. Even though I mandated to, uh, do, to give the 2%, the company looks nicer, but the company is going to push less, uh, back less against those 2%. And at the same time, the government can look good and say, look, I have this new policy when I'm forcing them to give 2%. So the government looks good because it's forcing the company to do stuff. So you can say that for the voters. And the company looks good because the company is handing out that money directly and can say to the consumer, buy more from me. I'm, I'm good at that. Uh, so, 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 so I agree completely and, and also refer to that in, in the paper to, to, um, the points here. First is that that is usually a key explanation for the Indian stats that it was important not only that the payments or contributions be made, but that it was be made through the companies because a key objective of that statute was to gather support of the broader Indian population to the liberalizing policies of the Indian government. So we have to support capitalism, pre markets, and companies. They are they're good. Look at what they are doing. So that was one one of the the, the opt. I, I mentioned the institutional pay failure dimension, but there was a one 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 key factor that appears in the literature was also that that optics dimension in legitimizing companies and. The free market. Uh, the second uh, point that is um, the subject of a of a paper um, by actually one even well, by Vic Khanna, uh, who is also a contributor to to, to my volume. He, they they test um, whether uh, that mandate affected um, uh, advertising expenditures because you can think that those uh, uh, those contributions can um, crowd out, and and they they did find that. Companies that spent more on CSR and advertising prior to um, to the statute, uh, they 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 decrease their expenditures. But those are, that spent less increase their expenditures. So so those are very important very important points. We have lunch. Great, right, thank you.
I don't know what to do. I don't know this join a meeting thing is a disaster. My telephone must be in the other room. What? My telephone must be in the other room. Yes, it's in the in the charger. Let's call Flavia. Why do these things never work? I was sitting there using it. No, I got it. I got it. I've got it. Hey, Siri. Call Flavia. Just to confirm. Calling Flavia Vera Skype. Okay, here you are. Well, it should open or not. It should open. There you are. So something's working. Professor are you here? Professor Coulter? All right, there you are. We are going just to just wait a few moments. We are going to start. Wait a minute, Blair. Come back. Hello. Blair, can you come back? Just a few moments. We are going to start. What's the problem? I don't know. What's going on? There I am, but I don't see yeah. them. Well, I've done what I can. Uh, well, now you Hello? Can anybody there hear me? Hello? Can anybody there hear me? Hello, Professor Luther? Are you hearing us? I can, can I can you I can't see anybody. Can you see me? Yes, we are seeing you in just a few moments, Professor. We are on the okay. line. Hello. Hi, Flavia. Hi, Bob. How are you? Okay. Can you see me? Um. Yes, I can. Can you okay. see me? Yes, I can see you. Oh, that's great. Oh, it's so nice to see you. Nice to see you, my dear. Yeah. This is 
this is so and so special. Everybody's so happy to have you, Bob. You're is our it, mentor. Is You're the working? father of law and economics in Brazil and Latin America. Is this working? Is there, is 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 the uh, is this uh, group there seeing me or just you? Um, they let's see. The auditorium is set up. Fernando, he's going to start now. So just okay. a second. They're going to be on. They just call, sent me a message that it was for me to get online. So it's great that we're online. The nice, they have a nice, um, the Green Ninth Latin American Workshop in Law and Economics and the 8th Annual Meeting of the Economic and Political Science Research Group. Second mm -hmm. meeting, this is terrific. This is awesome. And you, you know, I haven't met um, Michael Gilbert, Mike. Um, so this is going to be great, a great opportunity. I'm very happy to meet him too, because he's done a lot. He's been to Colombia and Brazil and people in Latin America are really happy, looking forward to you know, to, to learning more about the book and it's great. Well, he's a terrific young scholar. I'm so glad uh, that you're going to meet him and hear him talk. He's just one of the brightest young guys in the field, as you'll see. He's also, mm -hmm. he's also a dear friend of mine. Oh, that's great, Bob. One of the that's nice things about, um, uh, uh, being a law and, scholar, law and economic scholar these years is I've not only had good friends, I've not only had good friends, but in my scholarly career, I've also made dear friends. What could be better than that? Yeah, that that is very special. It is. In my point of view, it's it's what makes a difference. Yeah. And it's it's very nice. I just hope I oh, so that's better. I can see you centralized. Okay. It was great that you moved the camera. The auditorium, I see Fernando there. Okay. And Flavia, Professor Kutcher. Hi Fernando. Hi, hello. We have a few problems here <laughs> of showing us just as I was. There's a little delay in the voice. I, I don't know whether you have no, that or not, but I have a little delay. So it's not perfect, but it's pretty good. Yeah, they're setting up the... Okay. The that they're setting up. We just have to wait just a little tiny bit more. They're, okay. they're finishing uh, setting up. That's fine. Flavia, Professor, let's... Let's let's try to start. We have a few problems here with technology, but I think we can start. Professor Michael Gilbert is coming, but I think we can start hearing Professor Robert Kutter. And first of all, we want to thank Professor Kutter for all the knowledge that he provided us. Well, thank you very much. That's very kind. Fernando, I think you you went muted. We can't hear you. Oh, really? I don't know why that would be. Let me see. No, we're no Bob, we're okay. It's just Fernando the in the auditorium. We can't hear him. Because I think he went muted. He muted his for some reason. But you can hear me? No, yeah, I can, can hear, hear you. Me. Good. Okay. Now I can hear you. Okay. okay. You were you were gone. Now you're back. Okay, nice. We have the surprise of having here Professor Coulter with us. I am Well, I'll start talking about law and economics, whatever you want me to. You just tell me when to begin, okay? Okay. He he's he's just gonna finish the the introduction. Okay. For some reason they're having 
technical problems. Okay. Well, there's always some technical problem. We know that. Yeah. Claudia. Claudia. Boy. We are having problems here. I'm going to ask you to conduct the lecture. It's okay. Okay, fine. So we can hear you and we can see you, but we cannot speak from here. Okay, great. Um, so thank you, Fernando. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone for, for this wonderful conference and congratulate the organizers, Mauricio Bugarin and all the staff for the this impeccable event. It is so important to continue spreading research in law and economics. And this is amazing because now we've got Robert Cooter, Bob Cooter, our mentor, um, that was the the most important scholar and that was concerned about Brazil, Latin America, and came in 2007 and started Alactigy in Brazil. So he's been with Alactigy since 1993, right, Bob? And yeah. he has been the mentor of many Brazilian scholars, including myself and Fernando Meneguin and many others. So this would not would not have happened if it weren't for you. So my eternal gratitude, and I, I just hope we can spread and honor all of your effort and huge heart and kindness. And so I'm not going to speak anymore. I just want to say that you're a dear friend, way more than than the the respect that I have for you as a, as a scholar as um, the author of textbooks that are renowned of being here several years one after the other in many countries in Latin America even in the Yanomamis right you've been all over to study our institutions to bring information to share and to foster research and so this is my my huge respect. So I'm not going to speak anymore. Um, it's all yours. The floor is all yours. And we're going to have your student, um, Michael Gilbert, which is the co-author of Public Law and Economics um, with you, right? So you two have all, this is all yours, Bob. Thank you and welcome. Thank you so much, Flavia, my dear friend. First of all, I'd like to tell you everybody how much I love Brazil. Uh, I've not only flown over the uh, Amazon jungle to visit the Yanomami. I'll never forget that flight. I'll never forget the just looking out of the jungle. That's influenced me forever. Uh, just thinking about the environment there and how it's changing, which you could see from the airplane. And of course, the Yanomami tribe is famous in all of anthropology. So I got to see on the ground what it's like. And then we turned around and we flew east to the people of the sun. That was equally interesting. Uh, of course, uh, I, I visited, visited the major cities. I liked, it, I liked it so much that I took my, all my family for a vacation at Iguazu Falls. So I really feel like I've enjoyed Brazil and I've seen a lot of it. And I hope I'll be back again. Um, now, to, to return to the subject of law and economics, is most of the audience economists or lawyers or both? I think both, both. Well, okay. Well, one thing I wanted to say to you economists, you know, law is a much older subject. And um, uh, in some places, uh, law and economics, you know, as economics grew out of law, in some places they never fully separated. I used to go to uh, the... Uh, uh, to Belgium, you know, Belgium is divided, divided into the French speakers and the Dutch speakers. And I used to go to the French speakers sometime and lecture in law and economics. And in the first university of the French speakers, which is Laval Laneuve, the economics department and the law department have never separated. There's still one. That's the only place I know of that that's persisted, but that's the history of the subject. And, um, you know, when economics strays too far from law, it gets in trouble. I'd like to give you an example of that. Um, I've also been to Russia a few times. And, uh, you know, 
uh, uh, foreign advisors to countries really seldom uh, guide or influence the country very not much. Mostly they're brought there by some political faction that wants the political faction to be given the uh, prestige and the sanction of some foreign visitor coming in and saying they're doing the right things. Now, I'm not sure whether the uh, the, the uh, leading uh, advisor to the Russians was a guy named Jeffrey Sachs, who m- many of you will have heard of. I'm not sure whether he uh, led the, uh, actually influenced the path of the Russian uh, 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 policy or whether he just sanctioned what a faction there wanted to do. But I know this, the in- the advice he gave them was absolutely disastrous, and that's because he did not understand the law. He thought that if you could bring uh, privatiz- privatization very quickly there, that that would bring uh, the uh, law of property into existence. But of course, it did not. It was a disaster. When he tried to privatize industry very fast, what we got was not competitive capitalism. We got gangster capitalism. And that... Wow. That was a, a lot of the cause of the disaster that we had. Um, when I when I was there, I could see uh, middle class people desperately hungry. You know, if people have to choose between food and vote voting, they'll choose food every time, and that's how we got uh, that's how we got uh, Putin. So uh, this was a case where uh, a very brilliant economist, much more brilliant than me, uh, just made a mess of things because. He didn't understand the law. He didn't understand that you needed the law of property to make uh, economic competition work. So I'm just telling you that because a lot of economists think that because they understand econometrics and mathematics and uh, lawyers don't, that they they don't need law. They, They do need law. They terribly need law. And of course, lawyers need economics because without economics, they can't accomplish many of the goals that the law seeks to do. Uh, so now, you know, uh, we face tremendous, terrible problems ahead now with uh, the environment, uh, with uh, war, uh, with uh, what we see in Ukraine, what we see in uh, what we're going to see in the South China Sea. Is we, we face very difficult times. And these are times where law and economics are both going to be required. So I'm so glad that uh, uh, Brazil is uh, studying law and economics together so that the economists who have the tools and techniques will not make the terrible mistakes that uh, economists make when they don't take into account the way that law is needed in order to create competitive economies that produce enough wealth for people to be satisfied with their lives, for people to have enough, so they're not desperate, so they not do not abandon democracy uh, because they have to have enough to eat and they have to have more than that. So between um, the um, environmental problems, which, are, you know, they're about to get uh, cr- uh, crushing. Um, if the Gulf Stream turns off, much of um, uh, Northern Europe is become going to become pretty uninhabitable. I've lived in England quite a while. And if the Gulf Stream is diverted from England, England is going to be cold, so cold, you're not going to be able to grow crops there. So we'll have to see what happens. I, I, but I think that's going to happen a lot faster than anybody thinks. And the, of course, the economists know that uh, pricing pollution is the way to solve the problem. But we also know that it's been a complete failure politically. So um, economists have to work with uh, lawyers in order to devise uh, solutions to the environmental problems that are both political, politically practical, and uh, legally implementable. And we haven't found a way to do that yet, but we have to do that. So uh, uh, let's hope that economists and lawyers can work together to try to f- solve this terrible problem. Yeah, um, wonderful. Your your book. So Mike is here, Mike Gilbert. Hi, welcome. Thank you, both of you are here now. The authors of Public Law and Economics, and this is all that you've been talking about, Bob. Yes. Hi, yes. Can you see him, Mike? Yes, I see everybody. Thank you so much for having me, and I'm sorry for the delay. I can't explain why I was having technical problems, but Zoom seems to be working now, and I'm very happy to join you. 
This is wonderful. Hi, Pop. (laughs) So, Michael is both my dear friend and also just a brilliant law and economics scholar. Thank you, Bob. It's it's great to meet you, Mike. And your the book, the public law and economics book, is is very famous, and it serves exactly what you've been saying, Bob. Um, Bob, Robert Cooter was also my my advisor, dear friend, and and it was great that he came. And this is perfect. This is a huge gift for all of us because he's here to talk. You're here, so you two go out. Go ahead. <laughs> Give your presentation. I don't know if you were able to talk, to, to get to talk before this. Well, I have some things I can say, but Bob, do you want to do you want to start or do you want to explain the motivation for the book or otherwise? Well, I, I've, I've just been talking about uh, the need of law and econ- law and ec- for economists and the need for economists for the law. So that's uh, you know I, that's a kind of a meta question that lay, lays behind our book, and uh, I think mm-hmm. you can talk about our book, Michael. Sure, I'm happy to do it. So, uh, first, apologies again for showing up late. As I said, I don't know why I had technology problems, but I'm very happy to be here. And thank you, Flavia, for uh, moderating. And thank you to uh, Mauricio and to Lolly for the invitation. I know Bob and I are both very honored to have a chance to talk to this group about our book. I wish I could be there in person, maybe next time, or maybe some of you can visit me here at the University of Virginia. So um, first, a little background before I talk about the book itself. And um, everyone in the audience is aware of this. Law and economics has been very influential for 50 or more years at this point. There are scholars doing this work in law schools and economics departments and public public policy schools. In practice, there are judges using this kind of reasoning in their opinions. There are journals dedicated to the field. There are conferences like this one all around the world dedicated to the field. It's been enormously influential and successful. With that being said, most of the success and influence of law and economics has been limited to what we would call, uh, at least in the United States, private law topics. So much of the work concentrates on contract law, on torts, that's the law of accidents, on property law, and also on various aspects of business law, corporations, securities, bankruptcy, and so on. Law and economics has been much less successful or influential in public law. And by public law, I'm thinking specifically of constitutional law, constitutional rights, administrative law, topics like voting and elections, and so on. Now, to be clear, I don't mean that no scholars have written work at the intersection of public law and economics. Many scholars have done exactly that kind of work, um, including Bob Cooter, of course, and including, I'm sure, many people who are present at the conference in Brazil right now. So I don't mean that there is no scholarship that is fairly characterized as public law and economics. What I mean instead is that unlike private law and economics, public law and economics is not recognized or influential as a field. To give some examples, if you attend the annual meetings of the American Law and Economics Association, which is a premier destination for scholars doing this kind of work, you will see many panels on bankruptcy and many panels on contract law. You might see zero or only one panel on constitutional law. In the administrative law setting in the United States and elsewhere too, many scholars and thinkers and regulators use cost-benefit analysis, which is associated with economic analysis of law, but that's it. When, for example, thinking about judicial review of agency action, scholars and judges, they don't necessarily resort to economic models of delegation. Um, Uh, To give another example, when judges in the United States get a constitutional case about voting and the right to vote and whether and to what extent the state can place restrictions on that right to vote, they never ask themselves, what do economists have to say about voting? So in these ways, it's public law and economics is not as coherent as a field as private law and economics, and it's not as um, organized or influential as a field as, as uh, private law and economics is. Now, Bob and I uh, have asked ourselves on more than one occasion, why is this? There is work out there, there's good work. We think it should be influential in this space, 
but it hasn't caught on in the way one might think. And we have some hypotheses about this that I'll just briefly mention. First, and maybe most importantly, and you can see how this connects to the book, we don't think there's a single organized resource that draws together various lines of research on public law and economics and tries to synthesize it and present it in a useful and, and practical uh, uh, organized way. And our book tries to overcome that. But we think there are some other reasons too that public law and economics hasn't caught on in the way one might like. First of all, much of the scholarship in this space is quite technical. It relies on game theory. It relies sometimes for the positive work on statistical models. This is good, rigorous scholarship, but many judges and lawyers don't find it inaccessible. They don't have the training to make sense of these papers. There's another reason too, much of the work in public law and economics is focused on legal institutions. Institutions are of course, hugely important. We're interested in institutions too, but lawyers and judges in court usually are not answering questions about institutions. So a lawyer appearing before a panel of judges in the United States is never going to be asked how the judges should restructure the Environmental Protection Agency. They're never going to be asked how, if we were starting from scratch, we should design property rights. Um, these are not the kinds of questions that lawyers and judges ask, so institutional focused scholarship isn't necessarily interesting to them. There's a final reason I wanna mention that um, public law and economics has had limited success, and it has to do with values. In economics, the normative value, of course, is efficiency. And in a few minutes, I'll come back to talk about efficiency and what it means exactly and how I think it's sometimes misunderstood. It's easy to apply or to use an efficiency framework in some areas of private law, especially business law. But many people resist the relevance of efficiency to public law topics. They say efficiency has nothing to do with constitutional rights. And that's why economics has no place here. So Bob and I disagree on that last point uh, with the scholars who criticize economics. We think it has much to say here. And a uh, main motivation for writing our book was to try to overcome these problems and develop public law and economics as a field. So the book does try to provide a single organized accessible resource. It is by design, not technical. There is no calculus in the book. The game theory is very simple. We use lots of graphs, but very little math. We focus on institutions, of course, but we try throughout the book to focus on uh, legal doctrine, the kinds of questions that judges and lawyers are most interested in. And we also talk about values too. And I'll come back to that in just a moment. So um, one of the innovations, or we think it's an innovation in the book, is to divide the discussion into three parts. So we think of the economic analysis of law as coming in three different forms. There's positive, there's normative, and then there's interpretive. Positive analysis is familiar to everyone when we've engaged or when we're engaging in positive analysis, we're trying to answer questions about how the world works. So to give some examples that everyone's familiar with, what is the effect of strict liability on an injurer's precautions? What is the effect of expectation damages as opposed to some other form of damages on the likelihood of a party to a contract breaching? In answering these positive questions, we're scientists. We're trying to understand the world, not evaluate it. And we use a variety of tools to do that work, ranging from common sense on one end to technical game theory and statistical models on the other. The normative frame of economics or law and economics is different, of course. When we're doing normative work, we're evaluating. We're saying this is good or that's bad. So to continue with the examples, we might say, in order to improve safety, we should impose strict liability on injurers. Or in order to improve contracting, we should require parties who breach to pay expectation damages. Now, as I mentioned a minute ago, in law and economics and in economics generally, the normative criterion is efficiency. This leads to many conflicts in my experience between economists or scholars interested in law and economics and traditional lawyers, especially lawyers focused on constitutional law and human rights. As I mentioned a minute ago, those lawyers say efficiency might be relevant in contracting. It might be relevant to, const uh, to business or commercial law, but it is not relevant to rights. It is not relevant to the structure of the government. We have other values. Now, I think part of the 
problem or the clash in this space is really just a disagreement. I think many lawyers and judges, when they think about efficiency, they think about money. They equate the two. They think to promote efficiency, you need to increase money or profit. And that may make sense in business and contract settings. That's often the party's goal. But it doesn't make sense. Money has no place in constitutional law. And this is just a misunderstanding. Efficiency is not about money. Efficiency is about the satisfaction of people's preferences. Now, as it happens, people often prefer more money to less. And so it's easy to understand or to confuse the two. But of course, people can have preferences for many other things too, including the kinds of things that are usually of great interest in constitutional and public law. People can have a preference for equality. People can have a preference for non-discrimination. People can have a preference for peace and people can have a preference for dignity. It might be difficult to define these terms, but that doesn't mean they aren't real and it doesn't mean people don't prefer them. Insofar as people prefer them, they are incorporated into the notion of efficiency. And in this way, economics is, in fact, attentive to many of the values that lawyers and judges, especially in constitutional law, hold dear. To restate the point in the kind of language that Bob Cooter would use, consequences matter. And it's very hard to imagine anyone denying this. In thinking about public law, in thinking about constitutional law, surely at least one input is the consequences for people and their lived experiences. And that's what preferences are capturing. So in this way, the normative criterion that underpins economics is not so distant from the values in public law and constitutional law. Now, that being said, there is a limitation here that I think as law and economics scholars, we should confront. And it's that some circumstances can arise in which preference maximization, even when preferences are understood in the broader sense that I just described, preference maximization may not be the right social goal. So just to give an example, many of you have probably encountered versions of this before in conversations with philosophers. Suppose you lived in a society in which many, many people had a preference for discrimination on the basis of race or gender. If that's what people prefer, then in fact, it could promote efficiency to satisfy those preferences. But of course, many of us would recoil at this idea. We're tempted to say these are bad preferences or these are problematic preferences. Well, one solution to this dilemma is to acknowledge that in public law and in constitutional law, efficiency is an important and often relevant criterion, but it doesn't have to be the only one. If, for, if we want law and economics to be influential in public and in constitutional law, it's not helpful if we reject the normative or moral commitments of constitutional lawyers. So some of those lawyers would say, pointing to examples like the one I just gave, at least some of the time, the normative goal should be justice or dignity or equality. It should not be preferences. And my own view is that as law and economic scholars, we should accept that. We should be able to say, in order to grow our influence in public law, in some places, it's okay. The, the, the correct understanding of law is to pursue these other values. In doing so, we're not rendering the economic analysis of law irrelevant or pointless. It seems to me we're not weakening it. Quite, quite the contrary. Almost everyone who is promoting a law in public law or a public law included, aims to achieve some goal in society by changing people's behavior. And if you wanna change people's behavior, whether your goal is efficiency or justice, if you wanna change people's behavior, it's very helpful to understand their incentives and to try to shape those incentives. And understanding and shaping incentives is something that economics does very well. So even as we broaden, broaden the scope and come to focus on values other than efficiency, I think economics absolutely remains relevant. And that's one of the points that we try to push in this book. Economics is still helpful, even if you reject here or there its normative basis. Now, I said a few minutes ago, there are three frames or modes of law and economic analysis, positive, normative, which I've discussed. And now I wanna mention the last one, which is interpretive. This is a mode of analysis that is very familiar to lawyers, but maybe not so familiar to economists. When we engage in interpretive analysis, we're not trying to describe the world. 
as we do with positive work. And we're not trying to evaluate the world as we do with normative work. We're trying to find the meaning of law. What does the law mean? So to give some examples from the public law setting that we focus on in the book, in the United States, the US Congress has power to act in furtherance of the Commerce Clause in the US Constitution. Well, this raises an interpretive question. What's commerce? In the, gov in the Constitution of Argentina, the national legislature can act to promote the, quote, general welfare. Well, in determining the powers of the national legislature, we need to have some sense of what counts as the general welfare. To give one more example, in uh, Ireland, Switzerland, Swe Switzerland, Sweden, and in many US states, the, the Constitution says that amendments to the Constitution must be limited to one subject. Well, what's a subject? These are questions of interpretation. And as I said, for many economists, these are unfamiliar questions, but for lawyers and judges, these are the kinds of questions that they answer all the time. And to grow and extend the reach of the economic analysis of law, Bob and I think, and we argue this in the book, that law and economic scholars should spend more time thinking about questions of interpretation. Now, this isn't entirely new, to be clear. If you think of early work in the economic analysis of law, for example, Richard Posner's work on the hand rule and negligence, I'm sure you're all familiar with that analysis in thinking about whether the injurer was negligent because he or she took too few precautions, we weigh the marginal costs of additional precautions against the marginal benefits of reduced expected accident costs. In running that analysis, I don't understand Richard Posner or others thinking in this space to be making an argument about what negligence should be. They're making an argument about what negligence is. They're answering an interpretive question and they're using economic analysis to do it. So as this example, I hope demonstrates the interpretive mode of analysis in law and economics is not new. It's been with us for a long time. However, it's easy to miss. And the reason I think it's easy to miss is because in many areas of private and business law, the normative analysis and the interpretive analysis overlap. So think about contract law where parties are trying to maximize the gains from trade, it's easy to say normatively that the best law is one that promotes efficiency. And at the same time, interpretively to say, and in fact, the right reading of the law is one that promotes efficiency. These two lines of analysis collide or overlap. They don't collide, they overlap, they mirror each other. So we miss the distinction between them. But once we move away from these private law topics to public law and to constitutional law, then the normative and interpretive modes of analysis diverge. The normatively correct answer might not be efficiency, but the interpretive and the interpretive answer or the interpretive analysis takes us, takes us in a different direction. Our view is that the interpretive work is particularly um, important. Maybe I'll take a few minutes now and just briefly talk about the structure of the book and give a few examples of the topics we cover. And um, then if Bob has any final things he'd like to say, uh, we, can, we can take questions. So it's very difficult, we discovered, to write a book on public law because public law encompasses everything from mundane topics like speed limits all the way up to fundamental or foundational topics like human rights and the separation of powers. So we could not write our book in uh, a thematic way. That is to say, we couldn't go topic by topic in public law, or it would have been even longer than it already is. Instead, we organized the book around fundamental processes of government, so or fundamental processes of public law. And we think there are six of those processes, and I'll briefly state them. Bargaining. Actors in public law bargain with one another all the time as when judges haggle over an opinion or legislators trade votes. The second process is voting. It's easy to see its relevance to public law. We vote to elect our leaders in a democracy. Judges vote to resolve cases and so on. The third fundamental process is entrenchment. This is a particular feature of law and especially constitutional law. We make some laws particularly difficult to change. Why, how, what is the effect of that? The fourth fundamental process is delegation. 
This is, of course, very common in public law. The citizens delegate to the president and to legislators. The president and legislators delegate power to administrative agencies. The heads of those agencies delegate power to bureaucrats who work with them. Delegation is fundamental to public law. The fifth process is adjudication, of course. And the final process is enforcement. Once we have these laws in place, how do we actually make them work? So our view is that, uh, well, economics has a lot to say about all of these processes, these six fundamental processes of public law. And our view is that once you understand the economic analysis of these six processes, you understand a whole lot of public law, ranging from those speed limits I mentioned all the way up to the separation of powers. Now, for each of these six topics, we have two chapters. The first is a theory chapter. And in the theory chapter, we describe the economic analysis of that public law process. And we divide each of those theory chapters into three parts, positive, normative, and interpretive. This tracks the distinctions I, met, I mentioned earlier. And the idea is to try to push economic scholars, law and economic scholars, to wrestle with our normative assumptions and to wrestle with the interpretation questions that judges and lawyers um, are so focused on. The second chapter in each pair is an applications chapter where we try to pick up these ideas and apply them to a variety of questions or challenges or pub, uh, problems in public law. That gives you some sense of the organization of the book. Maybe if there's still a little bit of time, I'll talk just briefly about a few examples of some of the topics we cover in the book. Flavia, is that okay? Or am I running short? No, no, we have enough time. Yeah. Okay. okay so and, uh, okay. <laughs> so I'll just briefly mention, um, we cover lots of topics in the book, but here I'll just mention um, a few that will, I hope, give you some sense of the material we're confronting. And that, and that, and in each of these discussions, I've deliberately selected a topic that, that is relatively concise. So I can give you some sense of what we're doing in the book without having to go on and on for a long, <laughs> for a long time. So first example, in our chapters on voting, we're interested in the question of integrity in the electoral process, and in particular, the question of voter fraud, whether and to what extent there are any votes being cast or counted illegally, whether and to what extent the state should address or attempt to address this problem or perceived problem. This has been a very controversial issue, as you certainly know, in the United States in the last several years, and it's been a controversial in other place, uh, issue in other places too. Now, just to describe very briefly, the legal framework in the United States, in brief, works like this. Our constitution is not clear at all about the contours of the right to vote. And the US Supreme Court has acknowledged on many occasions that integrity in the voting process is very important. And as a consequence, states can limit voting in various ways or condition voting. For example, you have to vote in this location, not that one. You can only vote on one particular day. You need to present a certain form of identification to vote and so on. Now, some people challenge these state restrictions. They say it limits their right to vote. I can't vote because it's too hard for me to get to the polling place, or I can't vote because it's too difficult for me to get the identification that's required. Unlike many other countries, the US does not have a national identification card. The closest we have is a passport, which is somewhat difficult and expensive to get. So the way the Supreme Court and other courts have confronted this tension is with a very loose balancing test. They say, well, if the law looks like it infringes too much on people's voting rights, we're going to strike it down. But if it doesn't seem to have a big effect on voting rights, and at the same time, we have reasons to think that it reduces voter fraud, then the law is constitutional. So I want to focus just for a minute on that last piece. Does the law, the ID requirement, the location requirement, or whatever else, does it reduce voter fraud? In discussing that question, the Supreme Court focuses to the extent they get into the details on the total number of fraudulent votes cast in an election. Now, just to be clear, in the United States, we have lots and lots of reasons to believe that the number of fraudulent votes cast in our elections are very, very small, <laughs> but they're not zero. And at various points in our history, fraud has been a meaningful problem. So um, Bob and I, when we think and write about this question, we think the focus is on um, 
making sure that the outcome of the election has integrity. That is to say, if fraudulent votes turn the outcome of an election, that's a problem. And of course, that's the problem that states should be empowered to solve. Well, now we can run a very simple thought experiment. Suppose that Bob and I run against each other in an election, and suppose that each one of us gets 10,000 fraudulent votes. That's an enormous number of fraudulent votes for an election in our country. And those votes make absolutely no difference for the outcome. His 10,000 fraudulent votes exactly cancel out mine, and the election is just as safe as it would be if neither one of us received any fraudulent votes. On the other hand, if Bob and I run against each other and he gets 10 fraudulent votes and I get zero, that's much less fraud, but now the fraud could turn the election. If my lead in lawful votes is less than 10, he will win and he will win as a consequence of that fraud. So this is a very simple point, but it's one that courts in the United States have missed and that we think is easily made and important. If you're worried about fraud turning the outcome of an election, the question is not the total number of fraudulent votes cast, it's the relative fraud. How many more fraudulent votes is one candidate getting versus, versus another? Or another way to put the point is, if the effect of your anti-fraud law is to reduce the total number of fraudulent votes cast, but at the same time to increase the gap in the number of fraudulent votes for one candidate versus another, you're making matters worse, not better. And because the Supreme Court's test on this question is just this loose balancing test, our insight about this can be directly incorporated into that analysis. It's consistent with the way our constitutional law works. I'll give you another example that has to do with another hot button issue in the United States, and I know in Brazil too, fake news, misinformation. There's lots of information in circulation, more today than ever before. And it seems to be the case that some people, many people, including me sometimes, have a hard time distinguishing what is true from what is false. In the United States, it turns out to be quite difficult for the government to try to address this situation. And that's because for various interpretations of our constitution, specifically the freedom of speech and the First Amendment. I wanna mention briefly one important case about this topic from the US. Some of you, maybe many of you are familiar with it. The case is called New York Times versus Sullivan. I won't go into great detail, but the short story is this. On the one side, you have a powerful government official, and on the other side, you have journalists, a newspaper. And the journalists are publishing stories about the activity of the government, and the government wants them to stop doing that. The government wants to sue them for defamation. You lied about us, it hurt our reputation, and now you have to pay. So the question in New York Times versus Sullivan is, is whether this case can proceed and how. Or to restate, is it relatively easy for the government to sue and therefore silence and intimidate journalists, or is it relatively difficult? And the Supreme Court said it's relatively difficult. So again, I'll spare you the various doctrinal details, but the conclusion of the case is that in situations like this, when the government or some other powerful public actor is suing journalists over their work, the government or powerful actor has to meet a very high standard. They have to show that what the journalist said was not only false, but that it was, uh, it was um, intentionally false. They knew they had lied about it, or they didn't make any effort whatsoever to, to investigate the truth of their story. Now, at the time, and still today, in the United States, New York Times versus Sullivan, Sullivan is celebrated by many people for protecting the freedom of press and the freedom of speech. We're making it hard for the government to silence people, silence journalists. And of course, I'm sympathetic to that view. But New York Times versus Sullivan did more than make it harder for the government to sue or silence speech. It made it easier for people to lie. It made it easier for people to spread misinformation. And the logic is easy to see, especially from a law and economics perspective. If lying doesn't cost you anything, you're more likely to lie. And New York Times versus Sullivan made it so that in a whole range of circumstances, lying doesn't cost you anything or it's unlikely to cost you things.
So one way to understand uh, the effect of New York Times versus Sullivan is that it increased the amount of political speech and circulation, some of which is true and more of which is false. This may be contributing to our current misinformation environment. So we do two things in the book. The first thing is describe some of the dynamics that I just mentioned and try to show how economics can be helpful here. And I should say we, we connect our discussion of free speech to familiar concepts in economics, externalities, information asymmetries, and so on. The second thing we do in the book is propose a kind of thought experiment. If the problem is that people are not penalized for lying, and if the government, at least in the United States, as a consequence of our First Amendment, can't do anything about this, and probably shouldn't, because there is a grave risk here of government abuse, is there some market mechanism, or is there some private mechanism that could address the problem of misinformation? And drawing in part on work that Bob did 20 years ago, we argue in the book that the answer is yes, and it would require a system of truth bounties. So just very briefly, the idea would work like this. If you're a journalist, at the same time that you publish your story on the internet, you would deposit some sum of money in a third party escrow. That's the truth bounty. And when your story runs, there would be a kind of badge or icon at the top that tells everyone in the world that you're so confident about the veracity of your story that you have put money on the line. You have skin in the game. And if anybody in the world thinks that your story is false or misleading, they could simply by clicking this icon, file a challenge, and the challenge would go to private arbitrators. It can't go to the courts. That raises all the constitutional problems and all the government abuse problems, but it could go to private arbitrators and the private arbitrators decide if the story is deliberately false or misleading. And if the person challenging your story wins, they get your truth bounty. That incentivizes people to seek out and challenge false stories. And of course, if the arbitrators conclude that the story is not misleading or false, then the journalist keeps the truth bounty. Of course, the journalist wants to keep the truth bounty and the system thereby encourages you to be careful with your wording and accurate with your reporting in the first instance. You can see already the relationship between this system and the economic theory of signals. Suppose a truth bounty system were up and running and some people made statements without using the system their failure to attach a truth bounty to their statements would tell you something about how confident you might be or could be about the accuracy of their speech. There are many other details on that topic that if there's time in the Q&A, we'd be happy to discuss, but this just, this just gives you a flavor for it. Maybe I'll mention one last topic. This comes from the start of the book, and it has to do with a very familiar concept in economics, which is the Coase theorem. Now, in uh, the usual private law and economics setting, we think of the Coase theorem being applicable to, for example, a neighbor and a factory. The factory is polluting. This is creating a negative externality borne by the neighbor. What's the solution to this inefficiency? And the Coase theorem tells us, well, if the parties can bargain, that they will reach efficiency on their own. And it doesn't matter if the factory has the right to pollute or the neighbor has the right to clean air. These are very familiar examples uh, of the Coase theorem. And of course, the Coase theorem is very helpful in those settings. We see lots of things in a different way. In the book, we extend the Coase theorem to lots of public law settings. So we study not just bargaining between a neighbor and a factory, but we study bargaining among legislators. We study bargaining among judges. We study bargaining in the constitutional amendment process and so on. Now, remember, one of the or really the key insight of the Coase theorem is that when the transactions cost of bargaining are zero, which may not be very common in the world, but it's a good approximation sometimes. When the transactions cost of bargaining are zero, the parties will reach the efficient outcome regardless of the legal rule. So again, it doesn't matter if the factory has a right to pollute or not. We think this same idea can be used to pick up and understand lots of interesting practices in public law and in constitutional law. So here I'll just mention to you one example, again from the United States, the system we know best. And it has to do with a controversy that comes back every decade or two. And it has to do with government spending. 
Our government spends much more money than it takes in. And whether this is wise policy or not, it generates lots of political controversy about every 10 years or so. So some time ago, during the presidency of Bill Clinton, Congress tried to do something about this by enacting the Line Item Veto Act. So some of you might be familiar with this. Um, in the usual course, the US Congress enacts a bill to spend money, and that bill goes to the president, and the president either signs the bill and spends all the money, or the president vetoes the bill and the bill is dead. The Line Item Veto Act was a statute that said, the president has a third option. The president can go through line by line the spending bill and strike out the things he doesn't want to spend money on and keep the rest and sign the rest into law. And the question in the case that reached the US Supreme Court was whether the line item veto is constitutional or not. And the answer to the legal question, according to the court, was no, this is unconstitutional. The Constitution doesn't allow you to do that. So in the book, we're less interested in the court's conclusion about the line item veto and more interested in the consequences of the line item veto, which I should say does exist in many U.S. states and I suspect in other parts of the world, though I don't know for sure. So suppose that the legislators and the executive can bargain easily with one another. Their transactions cost of bargaining are zero. You include this provision and get my vote. And in exchange, let's add this other provision that I like and you, you'll vote for it and so on. If those parties find it easy to bargain with one another, the line item veto should have no effect whatsoever on the laws that the legislature and the executive together produce. If it's efficient for them, maybe not for us as citizens, but if it's efficient as to them to pass a big spending bill, they'll pass that bill. And it doesn't matter if the president has line item authority or not. And likewise, if it's inefficient, the best thing for these actors is to pass a narrow bill, well, then that's what they'll enact. And again, following the logic of the Coase theorem, it doesn't matter if the president has the line item veto or not. It does matter for distribution. Just as the neighbor would prefer to have the law on his side or her side, rather than having the factory have the right to pollute, the president would like to have the line item veto. That gives the president more power in bargaining and it means the president can get a greater share of the surplus. But in terms of efficiency, it doesn't make a difference. Now, just one more application of this. What if the transactions cost of bargaining between the legislature and the executive are very high? as they seem to be in the United States today. It's very difficult for them to agree on anything. Well, now, of course, the structure of the law makes a difference, just as it does in the scenario with the neighbor and the factory. So just to summarize this point, we think some concepts that are very familiar to law and economic scholars, the Coase theorem being one of them, can be picked up and applied quickly and fruitfully to a whole series of topics in public and constitutional law and can help us understand the structures and their likely effects and make normative recommendations and even address some interpretive questions as well. The last thing I wanna say, maybe Bob mentioned this or Flavia mentioned this at the beginning. Um, our book is available open access. You can download the book for free from the internet. You can share the book. There is no limitation on the number of downloads. Bob and I, we never expected to make any money selling the book. And in any case, money was not our objective. We want people to pick up the ideas and use them. And hopefully this will be uh, 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 helpful for students and also scholars as a resource. And um, thank you again so much, everyone, for the time and attention. I hope this is the kind of presentation you had in mind. And I don't know, Bob, do you have any concluding remarks? Yes. Um, the book, the paperback book, the paper, the published version of the book is very handsome. And so I just want to say that uh, as Christmas is coming up, it makes a very tasteful gift for your Christmas present. Uh, and it's modestly priced. It's somewhat under somewhat approximate $150. So I hope you all keep that in mind. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. And goodbye, everyone. Wait just a minute, Bob. We've yeah. got 15 more minutes. Okay. And um, Unfortunately, because of you know technical problems, we're not going to be able to have Q and A. But I don't know. Maybe we can 
um, you know, share your email if anybody's got any questions. And if that would be possible, thank you so much. And so many topics that are important. I'm currently in Brazil and the world and, and you know, and discussed in, in, in the pl public scenario. So I think the tools, wonderful. Gilbert at law.virginia.edu, right? Um, so I, I many of the topics discussed are, are really important. And many things came to my mind. Like I've had a discussion with Schaefer, for example, about compensation. Um, the difficulty in, in, in the winners compensating the losers to reach efficiency in policy, you know, Calder Hicks and um, because Pareto is not possible. And the, the difficulty is a lot political because many of the variables are not priced, are not considered, and it's difficult um, in the public um, decision-making process to be able to put in. It's beautiful in theory, but it's really hard in practice. And the other thing, I really like this, um, this last, the positive, the normative, and the interpretive, because like it, in Congress, when we wanted to, and Fernando Meneghini is, is one of the head in this area, we tried to implement um, a public policy evaluation system um, where the first question is, what is the goal of this law? What do you want with this with with this bill? What is the objective? Because many times it's kind of like politically not very clear for a good purpose because it serves an interest of a, a group. And so there's a lot of um, like interest that is that cannot be revealed and it's got a very pretty very social um disguised goal but the truth is the goal is something else so this is really really um interesting um th this is going to be great tool the book brings a lot of debates that are important and so i don't know if you want to talk more about this um i want to leave it to you um, and so, and, and I was w wondering whether, how can reputation by itself help um, to, to, in the middle, medium term, to, to show um, what is fake, what is not fake news. And um, so that, there's so many questions, so many topics, but the book is very important, I think, to, to, to put in categories and give an educational um, and bring all these tools that are important in this process. So um, we've got 11 more minutes. So if you two would like to talk about these things and, and know that people might be sending you questions on, e e you know, to your email. And thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you, Bob. Do you want to say something about the importance of reputation in the internet era? I've heard you talk about that before, and I think your view is counterintuitive. Well, I think I'd like to say something about the interpretive uh, theory of law, the economics approach to interpretation. Uh, law is not something that you uh, just want to contemplate like a beautiful poem or like astronomy. Uh, law has uses, and that's what uh, Michael was talking about, consequences. And uh, so the interpretation of law is especially concerned with the, achieving its consequences. Now, a law, you can either state the consequences in the, they're often stated in the preamble to the law. And uh, if legisl legislators want to uh, uh, control what is to be interpreted, they can say so in the preamble or elsewhere in the law itself. And the more precise they are, the more they take away from the courts the ability to interpret the law. But if, the, if they're vague and they're not precise, they leave to the courts the, uh, the capacity to interpret the law by finding in the general propositions about the law what, it's, what consequences the legislature was concerned with. 
but since economists are experts at finding the consequences of different laws, the more uh, the uh, court, pardon me, the more the legislature leaves the uh, finding of the consequences to lawyers, to, to the lawyers uh, leaving uh, the, the, the consequences vaguely sta stated in the law itself, the more leeway economists have to help uh, lawyers find what the consequences are and what it's required to maximize those consequences. So I just wanted to say that uh, about uh, the uh, interpretation of the law. Now, there's some people who are called textualists who think that rules of law are kind of like the Bible. You know, uh, God gave us the uh, rules, you know, like the um, uh, um, uh, don't commit adultery. And he didn't tell us why. Uh, and some people say that's just what God said and we've got to do it. Um, and some people think that laws are like that, that the founding fathers in America gave us rules and we just have to follow them. It's not for us to think about what the causes, what the uh, consequences might be or what the purposes are that the uh, uh, fathers, founding fathers had in mind. But I think that's kind of ridiculous. Of course, the founding fathers had consequences in mind. They just weren't giving us a document to contemplate its beauty. This is not a, we don't believe in biblical interpretations of the Constitution. We believe in consequential interpretations, that the founding fathers had things in mind, what we might accomplish by the Constitution. And we believe that biblical interpretation, insofar as textualism goes that far, just does not make sense. So I'm saying that I think that's true in any country. Uh, laws are useful. They're just not beautiful. They're useful. They're practical. And insofar as they're useful or practical, they have to do with consequences. And that's why uh, we econ economists have so much to say about interpretation. Maybe, if I may, maybe I can elaborate on that a little by mentioning just another topic we cover in the book. And this one is really rooted in Bob's, Bob's work. In the United States, and I know versions of this question come up elsewhere too, uh, in, in any federal system, there's a question about the division of authority between the national government and the state governments. And the U.S. Constitution, like many others in the world, is vague on this point. It's not clear exactly when the national government has authority to act and when it doesn't. And instead, the states are authorized to act instead. And some people in the audience may be familiar with one aspect of this question in the United States, which has to do with the U.S. Supreme Court's interpretation of the Commerce Clause. What does and doesn't count as commerce helps to explain or, 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 or drive the decision about whether and when Congress can act and when it cannot. And if you read the cases, you will see an exercise in confusion where the justices over and over are trying to draw a distinction between what they call economic and non-economic activity. And it's very hard, particularly for, for someone coming from economics, to make sense of the distinctions the court's trying to draw. And in the book, again, drawing on Bob's work, we have a different perspective on the question. And in very brief form, the national government should address national problems, meaning problems with externalities that spill across state borders. And state and local governments should address state and local matters, meaning matters that uh, uh, don't have externalities that spill beyond state borders, or in the case of local government, beyond local borders. Now, there's one more uh, uh, dimension to this analysis, which again grows from a central idea in the economic analysis of law that I already mentioned, the Coase theorem. If two states are right next to each other and one state is uh, has a set of pollution laws in place that are leading to bad air quality in the neighboring state, you can think of this as a kind of externality problem. The first state is not internalizing all of the costs or effects associated with its law. And as a consequence, its environmental or air pollution laws are too lenient. Well, what's the solution to this externality problem? One solution is to have the national government come in and impose an environmental law. But of course, another solution is for the two states to bargain with one another. And if it's easy enough for them to bargain, which it is not always, but which it might sometimes be, then what they can work out the pollution problem on their own. And so this leads to uh, a discussion in the book 
that says if there are interstate externalities that the states themselves cannot resolve through bargaining. So this would be more common when you're talking about an externality that spreads across 20 states rather than two. That's when the Congress is authorized to come in and make national legislation. If you can't solve the problem through bargaining, then you need to solve the problem through an, just an imposition of state, higher state authority. And as uh, this is an example in the book of what we call interpretive analysis, we start with the question that lawyers and judges are trying to ask, what is commerce? Or more generally, under what circumstances is the Congress allowed to act? And under what circumstances is it not? And we focus on the purpose of federalism, and then we develop this interpretation of the Constitution based on that. So it's just an example of a place where we think economic analysis is very helpful for the interpretation questions that lawyers and judges are focused on. And just to emphasize this one more time, um, I know many of you have seen this as law and economics advances as a discipline. It has become increasingly sophisticated and rigorous, which is, which is all good <laughs> and to be celebrated. But in the process of that evolution, much of the discussion in law and economics has moved towards positive questions about how the world works. There's less emphasis on normative questions, and especially in this public law space, very little emphasis on interpretive questions. And our view is there's just a lot more interesting work to do there. And we hope our, our book will provide the impetus for some of that. Wow, oh, thank you so much for your presentation. Wow, I, I have so many questions, <laughs> like um, how to reduce the transaction costs so that you can create incentives for both states to be able to negotiate and, you know, the, the externalities and all and, and many. But anyway, thank you so much, Bob. Thank you, um, Mike Gilbert, Professor Gilbert, for being here. Um, this is very special. And I hope this can happen more time, you know, many more times. And so I think we're exactly on time and very efficient. And so <laughs> thank you, you all. Flavia. Thank you, Flavia. Fernando. Yes. Flavia, thank you for being our chair. We have a few <laughs> problems here in the beginning, but everything was okay. Thank you. And I, I wanted to say to the professors that uh, we had a research group here in the University of Brasilia and during a whole semester, we were dedicated to study your book and it was very productive. So thank you for all the knowledge that you provided to us. And thank you, Robert Kutter, Professor Michael Gilbert, thank you for being here with us. Yeah, uh, can, thank you. Can you organize a meeting at Iguazu Falls? <laughs> Yeah. Well, we could try, Bob. You, okay. Would you come? Would you come? Yes, I think that would be a better, easier to organize than a meeting with the with the Yanomami. Of okay. course, yes, that for sure. That yeah, for looking sure. forward to this. <laughs> I'd like to. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, okay. folks. Bye bye now. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. Hey, Siri. Hey, Bob, it's me. Hey, Michael. You were absolutely superb. Yes. Is this just us on the phone or is everybody on the phone? Oh, okay. Listen, you were absolutely superb. I mean, that was really brilliant. I want to just go out and buy that book myself.
The presenters of this session, please bring your your presentations here.
Fica bom um pouquinho mais. O povo estava levantando para dar a volta. Está tão gostoso, está todo mundo tão feliz. Legal. Tá bem a luz, né? Tá só transcendental. Tá lá, lá acho que você não tem tanta coisa aqui. Eu já fiz aula. Tudo, né? Outra vez. Ah, tem dois juntos, tem dois juntos.
how does it work again? Okay. Eu falo, se você gosta de inglês, eu falo inglês. Olha, eu estava falando inglês, mas eu pensei. Hi, everyone. Start the session. You enjoy enjoy the session. Thank you, everyone, for um, being here. We know it is a hot Friday afternoon, so we appreciate the attention and the presence. Um, this panel will be composed of four presentations. Each presentation will have 20 minutes. At the end of the panel, we will have an additional 20 minutes for questions and answers. Um, when we are left with five minutes towards the end of the presentation, I will let each presenter know. And then um, one minute out, I'll let you know again. Okay? So, there's uh, uh, Fernando and Deborah presenting a paper on the optimal contract period of public concession uh, game theory analysis. Thank you, Karina. Uh, Slides. Thank you. So, our paper is about optimal contract period of a public concession. We are going to try to analyze this using game theory. First of all, uh, in introduction, we, we must know that public concessions is the contract signed between the public administration and a private company, so we can have uh, the exploitation of a public service. And of course, the, the, the public concessions they increased a lot because we have a lot of budgetary constraints. So it's a way of the, the public administration to, to try to solve this. And for, uh, in order to, got, to get efficiency, we must know that we have to design very well this public concession. And the, what we are going to analyze here is the duration of the agreements. How can we design this duration to get more efficiency? That's what we are going to study in this paper. The, the economic idea behind this is that uh, we, we, we must answer the, the question, is it better to adopt shorter contracts with frequent bids or adopt longer contracts. And of course, we have advantages and disadvantages to both of them. Let's see first in the, in the case of short term. In the case of a short term, a concession, uh, it's going to, to allow more frequent competition if we have shorter contracts. And we are going to have the bid process more frequent too, and of course the mechanism of information revelation, it's going to to uh, achieve efficiency 
improvements in a short period of time. But we have some disadvantages to the short-term contracts too. Uh, it's, it can happen to, to, to get insufficient investment, of course, and sometimes it's not going to be interesting to the private company to, to get this short contract. In the case of the, the long-term contracts, it's going to allow a greater accountability of the concessionaire and, of course, to encourage more innovation than the short-term strategy. But we have some disadvantages in this case, too, because we are, we are not going to have the information revelation mechanism frequently, and we, you, we are going to increase the probability of having the regulatory capture. So there, is some, there are some costs vinculated to it. Knowing this, we build an economic model uh, considering this fact here. First of all, we have government deciding if, he, if he, it's going to launch the bidding with a short term or a long term to this concession contract. And the potential concessionaire, they are going to decide if we are going to, if they are going to submit a, 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 pro, a proposal with a high tariff or a low tariff to this public service. The concessionaire, they want to maxim, maximize its return. And of course, the higher the tariff charged for the public service, the more interesting for, for the concessionaire. However, depending on the market being more competitive or oligopolized, a high tariff decreases the chances of winning the competition. So we have this hypothesis to our model. These conditions here, they, they show that we have the probability of winning with uh, uh, a small tariff is higher than the probability of winning with a high tariff. We are calling it of alpha. And regarding the, the concessionary's profit, we are going to have a higher profit with uh, uh, a higher tariff and a small profit in the opposite. Some other variables that we need to discuss is the benefit epsilon. That it means the, the efficiency gains from more frequent, frequent competitive pressure. We have this cost, CR, that is the risk of regulatory capture in the case of longer contracts. And we have the benefits, BI, that is the gain in long contracts of fostering more innovation. So, in the case of winning a low tariff, the consumer's utility is higher because they pay less for the public service, and this is going to generate uh, a gain you for society. And, on the other hand, the low tariff entails a risk of insufficient investment by the concessionaire, and it is going to, to cause a cost CI for the society. This way, we can design the game uh, with government playing if he wants uh, a small contract or a long contract, and the concessionaire choosing a small tariff or a long tariff. And uh, the, the payoffs of the government is the social welfare, and the payoffs of the concessionaire is the profit of it. The conditions that we can took when we solve this uh, applying the subgame per perfect equilibrium, we can have some some conditions, and they they permit us to make some interesting interest inferences. First of all, that the decision of choosing the low tariff is strongly related by the level of competition in the market. The more competition there is, the higher will be the probability of winning the the bids with a small tariff. And in the case of the, the, the government decision, we have this condition here, and it permits us to, to make some interesting inferences to this condition. It shows that the long-term contracts are preferable in terms of social welfare when the efficiency 
gain resulting from a frequent competitive pressure is not sufficiently high to compensate the difference between the benefit of innovations and the risk of a possible regulatory capture. So the result of the, the, the model it permit us to make some recommendations. We can adjust the institutional framework to reinforce the advantages of a long-term contracting. We can ensure rules that encourage competition in the market. We can reduce uncertainty factors uh, because it's going to, to favor the profit of the concessionaire. And we can build rules in the bidding documents that's going to stimulate innovation. Adjustments, they are going to, to favor an equilibrium with a low tariff and uh, a long-term contract. And now we have some evidences from, um, from of many economic sectors from Brazil, and Deborah is going to present it. Okay, yeah. That we, we are going to sector, uh, which we had an expansion in 2018 for 2019. And it's a sector that you have a high cost, uh, a high entry cost and low competition, so a low admin. And the, in this expansion, you, you spend in the contracts with clauses that reduce uncertainty uh, factors and stimulate innovation enhancing BI. Like uh, one of these examples, we can say the clause of mandatory investments and conditional investment like triggers. You uh, catch, uh, you get to turn from sector of demand, then you have to do more investments. So if it's aligned, you don't have trouble in the, uh, in the section ahead. So it's better for uh, the diminishes the transaction cost and the inventory of reversible assets. We have a lot of problem with this in Brazil. I work in TTU when we have a lot of a uh, lot a lot of processes that discuss the which are the reversible assets that at the end of the concession you have to return. Have a list of all of them, you have to return it, it's better, so you don't have a lot of transaction costs at the end. And these sometimes um, uh, get uh, problems for the continuity of services, because you discuss a lot and the service is interrupted. And other things that we, uh, we observed in this sector is uh, as since you extended the the term of the, the, the concession, the agency included a lot of regulatory issues are, uh, including quality indicators of the service that which will help the social control of it and A sector is the sector. You have two examples here. The fifth one, we have very low competition. It's not uh, very, uh, have high profit, so you have a low action. And uh, they extended it in 2005, and now they're seeing if they're going to extend or not, but probably. Yeah. Of X, uh, from we did also to to uh, compensate the of of capture. They uh, implemented regulatory improvements like service quality indicators. Uh, other uh, in the other side, we have mobile telephony, where you have very high competition and high epsilon. So we did the, the, the binding here and to enhance more and more the competition here, they designed the binding uh, determining with the requirement of only greenfield investment because you don't have difference between the interest. 
third sector, uh, it's not uh, it's the port sector. You don't have um, regular type of concession. You have something closer to 2020 here in Brazil. Sorry, uh, a framework of port sector and it encouraged a lot the competition and reduced information asymmetry and implemented a lot of very good innovation right, in this area. Testing through error. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> oh, it's okay now. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, and so so we have, we have a lot of innovation there. Uh, like, and now uh, we have a model that the quality control is made by the user, uh, at, which punishes the poor quality of the service with a drop of revenue. So you enhance the BI of the society when you align the incentive. Uh, other contractual mechanisms uh, that you we brought like innovation with passing on. It's the LinkedIn account. It's an account that you open uh, to serve some money from the, the grantee uh, to economic and financial rebalancing. Is that one thing thought after in a session? And to guarantee financial. So you, you get more uh, uh, safety in all, all the periods. Uh, it, it's because uh, we, we used to uh, receive this money and put it in uh, a single cash fund here in, in, in federal. Uh, had a lot of problems to like this, the balancing a guarantee. It, it, this is solving a lot of problems there. Other uh, other mechanisms. Financiers and uh, objective is to ensure of the concert by reducing the agency cost and present interest options. And uh, uh, we have stepping rights is the case in one clause that the financier can take the the concessionaire does not fulfill the contractual obligation of discontinuity of public service uh, as well as the transition cost. And the cross and investment is have a lot of different work. Have some obligations of uh, between the testing all of these institutions. Well, even TPU, right. And also TPU determined that, determined that the regulatory agency of ports uh, should of uh, price abuse and also do a capacity building of the services for perform the economic and financial problem here in Brazil. We, we just Lot. We digitalize a lot. And uh, the fourth factor we have is the road uh, transport sector. I have two examples for you. One, we did the binding, uh, the highway BR 116. And even uh, because we did the binding, the previous concessionaire offered the maximum discount. So we got the added value for society. Uh, enhancing epsilon and in the other case uh we are zero forty we didn't have that competition and they did some contractual amendments in, in the binding we we call is the new institution binding uh, it, there's some specific uh issues but it, it, it's going on and the clauses to mitigate, uh, we included clauses to mitigate risk of uh, economic and financial incapacity, contractual innovation such as linked and contribution accounts, and indicators of safety, fluidity, and service satisfaction. The last, the last.
Fast factor is the lattice factor. We, we, we have a lot of examples there. One good example of extension was in 1997 that we ex extended, had a long term for general investment, and it permitted a guarantee the investment capacity in the implementation of hydroelectric plants, uh, which helped to mitigate the effect of the water crisis in 2000. Uh, in the other side, on the other side, uh, this is a conf confession between 2004 to 2017 that were not extended, uh, showed more innovation, active uh, pressure, with higher investment in new technology and increased and higher revenue flow. Realization of free market and settlement in the short term market. At the end, uh, we, we can say that in the sector, we have a very high quality of the, the regulatory agent with the, the CR, and uh, we have service continuity indicator, service and uh, efficiency and economic and financial indicators of the concessionaire, which uh, uh, permit uh, the, uh, the use of social control. Uh, at, at the end, TCU also determined that we should have objective criteria uh, to the process of publicity. When the concessionaire goes loud because it's not working well, uh, not that they are offering a bad service. So you have uh, multiple examples how, uh, uh, that sometimes is good for for to have a long term concession and others it's better to buy and get the the good um so the the conclusion of the paper is that uh first of all the the game theory model explicit to the incentives and the trade-offs between a short contract and a, a long-term contract. And we can see that the equilibrium is a small tariff and a long contract that is going to, to increase the social welfare. It can be uh, encouraged by some circumstances, some institutional circumstances, that we can adjust the law to, to the, the probability of this equilibrium happening. And we have a possible extension of this paper that it's uh, a paper written by Maurice Bugarin and his co-author Ribeiro, and they find a way to to design the competition, the process, the bidding process to stimulate uh, an equilibrium to, to find uh, uh, an optimal contract to. to Of Professor Glasser, please. So, Hello, everyone. Uh, I hope you can tweet, tweet, tweet this microphone. Okay, so this is a uh, joint work with Tatiana Kalibanova that we saw presenting earlier today. This is, this is, uh, oh, like this. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so, what we're going to present today is an ongoing study that we're doing uh, comparing the what authorities actually do when they're handling abuse of dominance case. So 
been an ongoing research for many years. Uh, we took the, the challenge of actually selecting the cases and reading them and trying to code them in a comparable fashion across different countries. And we're going to present the results uh, of that. Also, relating that to other uh, jurisdictions, our goal is BRICS without China countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and South Africa. And the research was motivated by a number of, of ideas. The first is that you, you've seen in the past 20 years a great effort of harmonization uh, across countries of how to do competition. We, the, the, we see the rise and, and the consolidation of the welfare standard in many countries, even if, if in those countries the competition law does not explicitly emphasize that. You see uh, the ICN being set up, an international competition network for those that are not from the trade. Uh, and of course, if you look at competition policy itself, there are underlying common economic theory that can be used in cases in many different countries. I mean, we do competition policies, this has this interesting situation of uh, trying to reach local goals based on universal uh, valid models based on anything. And you have also learning by doing by agencies. So we had this idea, well, maybe over time, agencies are, are analyzing or using economic or uh, similar fashion. So that was the first way to understand that. So that required, of course, having a data for many years to see if we could see any of those trends if they're true. So we actually we set up to do that. Uh, and then there comes the question of what to compare. Yes. Didn't include merger, because that tends to be, yes, more. Merger cases, we took uh, abuse of dominance or conduct cases. And uh, we also selected only cases that had a condition. Why? Because then the authority had to go to And those steps, uh, we call them uh, legal standards. So what's What's the, the legal standard? Some, some people from law itself may disagree that we should call them. But the idea is framed with, with into the uh, dichotomy or the extremes of having cases that uh, for the authority to come to a conviction or to a conclusion that we should convict it if, if uh, defendants, you only have to prove that the practice existed. Then you have the other extreme where that have a conviction you would have to post penalty. You have to, to show that harm was uh, present, or at least the likelihood of harm was was, was there, uh, depending on the on the country and the law itself. So we're going to look at the level and the trend and the trend. Also, we since we have the data in our hands, we want to use. Uh, to see what influences the, the, the legal standards over time. So the, uh, I'm trying to associate here a little bit about quality in the sense that it takes more time, it takes more effort to do a full effects based analysis. So maybe the budget and, and learning uh, does influence the, the lab. And so we try to explain. It's uh, mostly explanatory. Uh, we do have some back theoretical background to motivate the hypothesis. But we were excited that we have this data that's unique, and so we're trying to explore and, and present the results to you in an organized, economic way to provide information. Well, uh, but no, we're not presenting yet another international uh, competition policy indicator. You can hear that. Because we, uh, why not? Because we decided that we, in the sense of the research team, that, that, that we're doing this analysis, not this, that not only this paper, there are other papers around. We decided to go within case analysis. Usually, when there's a trade off, we wanted to make information. 
So mostly they mostly read the, the, the competition law. They read competition law and try to provide a comparison between them. No, that means you actually see what you're going beyond to what's competition policy in the book. You actually see effort and what steps the authority reach the conclusion. And so we're also fitting in this new trend in applied law and economics, which looks at case decision. Better uh, training machines to help us. Legal standard or decision rule in our paper, it describes how the decision, whether or not a certain criteria is classified in competition law cases is reached by a presumption, for example, have authority that decide, oh, uh, take a cartel. There's a tape, wiretap, wire there's a document. You even have two companies that sign the contract. There, the, the market, uh, overstep the other. Uh, and the, they go because the four party started to really go in. Else, uh, and that will suffice to, sh to show that there's, there's harm to uh, competition. So you have a presumption associated with that that the, the, there's no way that such a cartel would have benefited consumers. That, that's the idea. Uh, in other cases, you may need not only that the cartel was present, the agreement was present, but in addition, that you had uh, uh, dominance by the firms. So the, 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 the firms involved, or the firm that were involved in the cartel case, uh, they had, or, or on the vertical restraint, you had the ability to um, create harm. So maybe you don't have to show that price is increased. Comes from by eliminating alternative explanations. Uh, and that, so and so you have this streams on and this continuum between the, the per se and the effects based or rule of reason depending on, on the country. And we're going to explore this continuum. I will basically five steps. Okay, you the found that clearly defined uh, that's been uh, decided. Do we have basic analysis of market characteristics? Uh, or it, was there a formal market definition done or just a statement of the, mar the, the relevant market is this? Like, that's not enough for us to, to characterize that there was an actual investigation about. The... Then you go on to uh, check whether the uh, conduct, for example, the agreement, the vertical restraint had a market power enhancing or had a freedom we want to understand if there was an articulation of the then uh, whether there was a discussion of potential efficiency defense, everything with a balancing of those. Now, some countries, for example, they take some of the steps, uh, and we're going to have to face a situation of the last step that almost always you must, uh, the, the, uh, it's the defendants have the right to present possible efficiencies, whether the authority takes those into account or not. It's uh, it's what we're going to to see whether they have taken that into account and actually try to do the balancing of potential. Very enlightening to for you to have the challenge to read the cases and see how the authorities uh, actually go about doing their business. So we classify them in 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 up to six LSI, where you you uh, where you have an additional step in the analysis. It would be great if the authorities would take all steps necessary. Of course, we're not discussing here what's the optimal level of the cost involved. Uh, in doing that, so authorities may choose the liberty to help them. To but uh, since we do recognize, and there was a lot of missing steps, we started to analyze in two ways. The first is the legal standard itself, where we required all steps to be present. 
and the other one, which is the maximum level of economic energy taking, uh, often the next or, or five or two. Uh, but often, sometimes you, you may have not a relevant market definition, but the discussion of the, of the ability of the firm to impose consumer harm. So, people, so firms would skip B and go, I'm sorry, the authority would go from A all the way to C1, skipping B. So in this case, the, the maximum A uh, would be uh, three. So this is just to give you, oh, and of course, uh, it matters what type of conduct you're doing. So we didn't take the same, uh, we didn't consider cases as a whole. We are analyzing five uh, conduct groups. First, uh, explicit horizontal agreements. The second, tacit collusion, which in, for example, in the, in the case of Brazil, we call in Brazil for, for the Brazil. Um, we call concerted practices in our environment. Uh, influence to, for a um, uh, act or uh, explicit cartel we call it characterizing as G1. That's how you and, and then you can have a view of basis how they are decided. Of course, mostly of abuse of dominant cases. Uh, Russia has a disproportional number of cases. And this is something that The theoretical framework comes from the work of Dennis Katsolak and the authors, and theory itself always discusses how efficient, uh, what would be the optimal legal standard. So those are, those are the six empirical hypotheses that we're going to explore. First, uh, is there uh, equal le legal standards, or at least a uniform ranking of standards by group of conducts? Do we have this kind of harmonization? Okay, okay we understand. We would expect cartels to have very low, just not even dominance may be required in some some jurisdictions. For example, for a vertical restraint, do we need? Uh, are all countries using real? Uh, is there an increase over time? Uh, we're going to explore the 2000s, the 2000s end when, when the ICN was very strong and there was a lot of capacity building across these regions. Is there a cross-country convergence of legal standards? Or do we have, uh, here I'm, I'm drinking from the future on convergence that we have not only average level convergence, but Is there an uh, increase in consistency in the sense that all five, six steps of, uh, let's say, European st style of effects based analysis uh, taking care of all the steps, or do we see still gaps over time? Gaps is, is keeping one of the gaps. For example, not showing consumer harm, but accepting a Assume that this. Yeah, the authority would say, well, market concentration is so high and, and there's a literature that says that this vertical restraint is bound to have negative effects and the, and the efficiencies were not credible, so we're going to think it. But uh, although the authority did not actually... In our case, we have a stupid, we have a gap. Over time, there's this gap. And the last one to see if the authority, uh, if resources matter for that type of thing. Of course, it's costly. Oh, the level. Uh, again, remember, six would be full effects based with balancing, measuring, measuring efficiencies, all the steps. And one would be just per se in the sense that not even uh, testing if firms were dominant above a minimum threshold of market shares, not even that. But here's the numbers, uh, here's some averages across country, Brazil, Russia. You can look them across, down, and I know there's information here for you. Uh, let's start. Cartels, lowest in general, okay, it's like it. 
uh, concerted practices, vertical restraint, dominance, other types of abuse of dominance, exclusionary practices. Uh, pressure has tend to have the lowest in general, and, but other countries can do well uh, comparative. Here's Please note that these two are comparable from one to six, and here's the proportion of cases where you see steps of the analysis. But are these countries unique? Is it high? Is it low? Let's compare. Let's compare with uh, European Union, Greece, and France. The same view. It's 2.67. If you go back, uh, here we have 233. Comparable across countries, we, we believe it is. So even mature jurisdictions also do not use a full effects base at the end of the day. So they strive to do that, but often they don't. But let's look at the, our hypothesis. My time is running out. Okay, we have very unbalanced sample, and we're going to look over time. Uh, but I want to be as flexible as possible. I don't want to put any restrictions on performance independence across. Uh, so we're interacting basically everything, the type of conduct, the country, uh, time, time trends with country specific, context specific time trends. So, have a lot of parameters to show you. Time to show you. So, I hope you believe uh, that the, the following my, our conclusions uh, okay, for the legal standards. And, and we also include. Uh, control variables such as budgets and so there's a lot of tables that uh, we have here. You see the trends over time of the oh, and this is the standard deviation because we're testing some of the variables. Uh, what happened over time? Which is great. I mean, we have different cases. We have uh, we can look by conduct, and we have a number of cases within each country within each conduct. So we can look at the standard deviation, which allows us to, to make the weighted averages of what happened over time. So actually, you don't see a decrease in the way that cases are analyzed. And cases are more heterogeneous themselves, but you don't see any clear trend downward. Uh, it's stable, it's very Our main conclusions were there was not an equal legal standard in from ranking, even controlling for many different things. Uh, there was no an increase in the average legal standard over time. In flat or very not significant positive. Uh, we didn't see any cross country convergence in the sense that the average nor did the standard deviation across countries and within conduct changing over time uh, in, the, in the direction of decreasing over time. For some for some groups of conduct, we do see uh, authorities, those authorities uh, getting more coherent in their analysis, so the number of gaps decrease, and for some countries, resources matter, but not for others. Summary and hope you're interested to read the paper, just send us an email and we'll be happy to send you. That's all.
Hi everyone. So oh, thank you for uh, Mauricio for this amazing workshop, and thank you all for being here. Well, this presentation might seem a little off topic uh, because my approach it's more uh, computational. So I will assume that not all of you are familiar with text mining, and I will try to present you uh, of the methodology. Well, the the main point is do Brazilian municipalities plan their budget? Uh, in Brazil, we have three different kinds of budgetary laws. Uh, a four-year plan, it's not a, a perfect fit with the mayor term, mayor, governor, or president. So it's three years in his term and one year for the other term. We have uh, a budgetary guidance law. It's for each year to kind of adapt this uh, four-year plan for one year and the actual budget, the real budget. So we think this first two, the four-year plan and this guidance uh, budgetary law are the planning for the budget. But I work in the audit court, I'm a project curator, and a friend of mine, an auditor, uh, he used to complain all the time because all the the guidance uh, budget law look the same. So he said it's just copy and paste. And it looks like copy and paste, but how can we measure exactly how they are similar? It's not easy to, to compare those two laws. Uh, we know that there is huge discussion nowadays about plagiarism, and it's not about that. The main point is how good they are planning uh, the budget. So we start to think a method to, to use all of this data, all of these uh, budget laws we have, and we're trying to find the best way to compare those laws. Well, we start to deal with uh, tax mining, and tax mining, it's a way to discover patterns or any kind of things in text, as it might suggest. Uh, we might have several approaches like predictive or uh, descriptive ways to, to deal with text mining. Uh, it's the main use are for uh, classification or we can use in a regression or in clustering, but we just want to compare those laws. Are just copy and paste or they are planning effectively? I would try to, we had to go further and in text mining, there's this knowledge discovery in database. It's kind of a process of using the database, using the all the information, and try to uh, discover the better way to uh, to use those information. So there, there are a lot of discussion, especially nowadays with uh, chat GPT, for example, if in plagiarism, if I just copy one text and change the words, it's the same thing or not. In this uh, discussion, in this paper, we're not, uh, it's a work in progress, so we are still uh, doing things. Uh, but we don't want to, to know if it's plagiarism or not. We just want to see if it's just cut and paste or they are playing. So what did we do? This budget guidance law uh, should be a plan. And we got two states, uh, Paraíba, my state, we had uh, 223 uh, municipalities. And I got also from uh, Minas Gerais state, it's uh, 853 uh, municipalities. Uh, we got all the uh, those laws, these guidance laws to try to use. So first, most of them are in pictures. So if we had used a kind of OCR to transform in text, uh, then we had to tidy the, the whole mess, you can imagine. Uh, and it's classical, we had to take off the several stop words, uh, because the stop words doesn't mean anything. It's like prepositions, uh, the name of the city, uh, the name of the, the bulletin, the name of the, the diary, the journal, whatever. So we had to take everything off these stop words to compare just the, the meaning words 
uh, the words that have some uh, some some meaning. And then after that, we start to compare how we did that. Uh, we have in literature several ways to compare, like a uh, a near uh, a near uh, near. Uh, Neighbors, they near neighbors, uh, nave based algorithm, rock algorithm, and all of them, uh, they have, uh, good points, but they're not perfect fit for comparative two laws. Usually they use just, uh, count the number of the words, uh, the frequency, uh, they use the term frequency times to, uh, inverse document frequency to, to show how relevant the words are for the text. Uh, so, and it, just explaining that the two, it's this, this frequency approach. It's just to see the importance. As you can see, the term frequency, it's the relative frequency of each word per in, in the text, uh, due to the all frequencies. And the inverse document frequency is the, comparing the, the number of documents who contain those words. It's just to see how important uh, those words are. But again, this just show an analysis about the words, uh, not if the laws are the same. Uh, those histograms shows the frequency of the words it was important to see how, in general, uh, the words are uh, similar in the in the laws. What makes sense because all the laws are for planning the budget. It's around the seventy percent of the, the similarities of the words, not the the law. And see Minas Gerais, it's almost the same thing. Uh, our other approach is like comparing the the root of the word. It's just for uh, lexical approaches, so we didn't use. And we have some similar measures, uh, especially those two are more used. It's the car similarity coefficient. They took several, uh, you have to identify what's important in the text and point some attributes in the text. And it's divided by the number of the, the text you have. This recall is almost the same thing, but instead of comparing of the whole corpus, you compare by each text. And the cosine similarity, it's the same idea of uh, linear algebra, uh, the, the cosine uh, similarity that you really good to use in this equation, because as you can remember in, from linear algebra, uh, if you are comparing two points, you, in a Euclidean space, you use the, the distance, but comparing vectors, you use the cosine. So we use those uh, idea to transform each law in a vector. Uh, so we could compare the uh, cosine of those vectors for the inner product of those two law divided by the norm of each one. And after that, we, we just could analyze uh, almost eight or five percent of the laws from variable. Several are completely hard to transform in text. In 500, in 15 from minus, almost 70 percent. And we identified uh, 151 just copied. We established a 90 percent of, of similarity, close enough to say that it was just a copy. And we could identify several clusters uh, in Paraiba uh, 50 and in Minas uh, 50. You can see in those vendor rams, but it doesn't matter too much. So after that, we saw there are some laws that are completely, almost completely equal. Okay, it could make sense. Uh, let's try to understand what would explain that situation. So the first thing we plotted those groups in the map, and this Paraiba state, the, the map, 
and it doesn't make any sense. There's no geographical uh, explanation. Maybe some social or economic uh, variable could explain. No, it doesn't. Uh, so maybe the party of the of the mayor? No, it doesn't. The only variable that could explain reasonable enough was the accounting office. Each state, each municipality, they used to hire uh, an account, a private account, to make those law. And so they probably are just copy and paste because, for example, if uh, accountability of it from this municipality and that one, they just use the same model, the same approach to, to use, not planning. So uh, we couldn't do the same thing for Minas Gerais because we didn't have all the data. We just got the data from the, the loss and we saw the same pattern in the, in the state, in the social and economic area, but we didn't have the information about the accounting uh, office I think probably it would explain well uh, how those laws are made. In general, this was the idea. Uh, as I told you before, it's a work in progress. So we are trying to try to identify what's the best to to compare those laws. Uh, and we found that at this moment the cosine uh, the best approach to compare the laws. That's all. Thank you. Oh, bear with me. This is the final presentation. I've kindly asked uh, my colleague David to be my supervisor <laughs> and my enforcer of time. So I'm going to thank Brad so for quickly having already um, overview sort of how the budgetary process here in Brazil works. Um, so I'll briefly go over that. I will spare you a more dense literature review, um, but I will start with trying to justify why we should be looking at green budget at all. And maybe I can start by, instead of going into, well, we see it on the news all the time, I'm gonna start with two very concrete examples. One, yesterday, we had an override of the electrical grid in Brasilia due to the excessive use of air conditioning, uh, which then led us to a very Greek, a Greek type setting, you know, where we were learning in the open air and it was a fantastic learning experience very innovative, very unlikely. Now, would this have worked under rain? It would not, which would have limited severely the, the amount of information and I would like to believe the amount of knowledge I accumulated over this conference. So it would have hindered the effectiveness of our time together. And then the second point is everyone is hearing about the Amazon, right? So Brazil, the Amazon, wow, the lungs of the world and the largest sink and how the Amazon is so important to guarantee climate resilience and whatnot and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The Amazon is facing the largest drought in over 120 years. The, the federal government announced before yesterday 17.7 uh, .7 million hives. Um, with they're expecting to add on to that to accumulate a total of 25 million hives, more or less, five million dollars. Assist municipalities in um, dealing with this very dramatic climatic effect, uh, climate, extreme climate effect. Um, so the first thing that, and when we see all this on the news, and what this um, graph just briefly shows is, well, the Amazon is super important, but um, we need money to finance climate adaptation and resiliation. And if the and if the Amazon is to be the lungs of the world, and if the Amazon is to be very important, then Brazil should be cutting off a lot of this, how much money we need to actually um, be able to build better um, policies. Right? 
So just a brief literature review, and then this is going to go into something um, that I think uh, speaks a lot to what we've heard today. So first of all, um, this we initiated this discussion talking about what my advisor, uh, Fabian, Professor Fabiana Halasha, discussing sustainable development and saying, well, this is a very in fashion thing right now. Everybody's talking about ESGs and going green. But uh, at the end of the day, we don't really know what sustainable development concretely means from a policy perspective. And we also don't know what sustainable development means from a fiscal point of view. So the first thing that we needed to understand was, well, what does sustainable development mean in terms of where governments should be acting in Brazil, right? So we're very much concerned about the Brazilian context, very complex federative context. It's very extremely heterogeneous. The first thing we said was, well, Economic and social issues seem to be already very much in discussion, and it's very clear. So Bolsa Familia needs to happen. It's sort of a consensus, right? We need people to have equal opportunities. We need people to have human development. Um, economic issues, central bank independence, great win. Um, we, have, we have controlled inflation. We have been able to stabilize our monetary policy to some extent, and to some extent also um, our fiscal policy, as we will see. Um, but the green part of sustainability, right, where we don't want future generations to be harmed by our decision, isn't as well equated into our policy design. And then, okay, so now we're not only, we're focusing on green rather than just incredibly sustainable, which is much, much wider. So this brings about an issue which is, well, green budget, right? So we went from an idea where, well, there is a very clear uh, market failure regarding climate and regarding environment. I mean, no one really needs, everyone says it here, and I'm not really going to go into it, right? There's a collective action, a very evident collective action issue regarding environment as well and green issues and a very evident public goods dilemma as well. So this all limits growth and limits our um, potential to actually stimulate future generations rather than limit them. So then we need to talk about how we're spending money to make sure that this, all these issues are not really, how we're being able to tackle them. And then to do that, what we propose is a way to tag our, our budget. And then we started initially, so this is also an ongoing work, we started in efficiency analysis. So we have two blocks basically of data. One is budgetary. And again, the budgetary process here in Brazil, it, it is a very complex process and it begins and initiates in our executive branch. It is then put into a bill, which is then forwarded to our Congress. And that's why this is a, uh, it says bill right there. So we have a budget that is supposed to be what the Congress, what it, which is proposed to Congress, but then Congress analyzes it. Uh, infers what is going to be the initial appropriation. So there is a political step right here, which involves bargaining and political negotiation. This then goes into what the ministries actually uh, uh, spend, and then actual spend expenditure can be decomposed into these areas. Okay? Um, also, we look at another block, which channelize efficiency, which is basically sectoral contributions. So how much emissions are going into these main sectors, okay? Uh, these are both uh, secondary data. We, we are not doing primary data analysis at this point. Okay. So again, our process is we have a four-year uh, budgetary plan, a pluriannual plan, a, sorry, a pluriannual, not budgetary, but policy plan. So here, it would be almost as if right here, this is a legal instrument that determines the strategies the government wants to take. And then we have the annual instruments among them uh, like Brad's already put, we have sort of an operational view, which would be how much budget we're actually going to spend and on what. So goods and services, okay? Then we look at having this, uh, we needed to analyze, well, what is green and what is not green? And what we did was we proposed three different tagging um, mechanisms. One is a broader one, and then we scope that down into a narrower tagging mechanism. Uh, the first one is basically looking at what the UN considers adaptation and mitigation. What policy directives, so first we go into the programs stated strategically, what programs are directly addressing these issues? 
And then we go into, well, given that these programs exist and that we've identified these programs within these programs, each one of these um, actions have an objective. Like, what am I spending? Why am I spending money on A? So then we go into why are you spending money on A? And then again, we cross that with what the UN and what uh, countries have agreed to can be defined as adaptation and mitigation. We then look at Brazil's national policy for climate change. And you say, okay, well, we have a national policy for climate change. So how does, how does this actually, how is this projected into our budget? And then at the very least, and this obviously is a, uh, narrower, and how then we look at a very, very specific point, which is emissions. So each country determines how much they're going to emit in their nationally determined contributions, but uh, we don't necessarily have a plan to how to mitigate emissions or how to decrease emissions. So we wanted to see if the budget at some extent directly addresses emissions. So uh, we do, I'm not going to go into detail, the uh, extended abstract has this. We do a synthetic index for each ministry and we say, okay, so how much are you actually contributing? Are you ceasing? Are you trying to hinder the emission contribution in these sectors? So we have that per ministry. And within each ministry, we have different budgetary units. Uh, we suppose that across the ministries, are, all the budgetary units in the ministries are uh, contributing this proportionally to the same, to surmount to the full ministry contribution to emission decrease. Okay? Um, and then after this, we run a data, data development analysis, which basically considers what we have in budget as our inputs. So our three uh, green budgets under tags A, B, and C. And then we look at uh, the products that we looked at are the, the synthetic uh, environmental indexes. So we do run both an output and input um, oriented uh, DEA. And basically what we want to do on the, the output one is just say, well, um, given that we have a certain, uh, given what the budget we have, could we be producing more in terms of reducing emissions more? And then in the input oriented, what we're, what we're asking is, given what we're producing in terms of emission, of re emission reduction, could we reduce green budget? Both are efficiency analysis. Um, so first, I'm going to go very quickly into our descriptive analysis. And the main takeaway here is, so this is a straight line. This is our, our broader tagging criteria A. This is our B criteria. So this is our second criteria. And this is our third tagging criteria, our very narrow. Um, so the first thing that we can see here is under A, uh, you see much higher levels. So it peaks. Uh, so here we have an average of seven points sort of, um, whereas the other two criteria is you don't really see such a peaking behavior. Um, these uh, gray uh, blocks represent the three PPAs. So in terms of what we sort of suspect here is that under uh, Juma II uh, presidency and under the Tame presidency, adaptation, so this is actually Juma II because this is her paper. Um, uh, adaptation and mitigation seem to be issues much more concretely addressed than under uh, Bolsonaro and under Juma one. And it, a very important thing is under uh, Bolsonaro, all criteria decrease. So when we read on the media, everybody's like, oh, media is very uh, dramatic. It's saying Bolsonaro ruined everything. Um, regarding climate initiatives, like financing climate reduction, he did. And under the three criteria, he did. His government did not prioritize this policy. Now, um, a natural question that anybody would ask, well, well, Karina, right now you're looking at the proportion, right? So you could just be a case of numerated versus denominator issue. But we see that, no, actually, during the Juma uh, um, you and, and crossing this with the Lolas, you see that th there is a more significant uh, allocation towards uh, green budget period. Okay. Uh, the columns are the um, And then uh, the point that another thing that arises is that remember how we have all these different budgets, right? We have the budget that was sent to Congress, the budget that Congress approved, the budget that is actually spent. So we wanted to look at well, given that you have an initial budget, how much are you spending? Does this um, is there difference enough for us to? to want to argue that when we're looking at an efficiency analysis, part of the lack of efficiency that we might see might just be due to poor spending capacity. 
So what we see here is that on average, yes. So we do have um, higher initial appropriations than we do commitments, okay? Um, under the three criteria. Okay. And then another point is what happens to the amount of ministries or office? Because this is both ministries and agencies. Um, what happens to ministries and agencies uh, according to the tagging criteria? So there's also a very different um, profile, and this leads to, well, what are the top ministries? And when we look at this, what is particularly curious is that our Ministry of Environment, which is MEMEA, uh, is responsible, is solely responsible for the national policy of climate change. However, it does not appear among the first ministries with the green budget, not under criteria A and not under criteria B. So under criteria C, which directly refers to emissions, it is. What this indicates is, and then this speaks to our, our um, previous lecture, what this indicates is that potentially there is a very strong governance issue. So the way that we're regulating um, Green, everything green is just bad. It's very bad regulation. We need to be changing our instruments, our, norm our normative instruments. So um, these are some questions that arise. Uh, but, uh, and then we go into, well, the efficiency analysis. And what becomes clear from a very uh, initial step towards analyzing efficiency is that there is room to grow. And it really doesn't matter which criteria. The thing that changes a lot is the dispersion between the how much, how inefficient you are. So the broader, naturally, the broader the, def, the, def, the tagging criteria that we're using, the higher the dispersion. But under all um, tagging criteria, there is room to grow. So given how, how much reduction we're, we're, we're actually achieving, um, we could potentially reduce how much green budget. That's what this is telling. Um, and then, Given we have the same green budget, could we be producing more? And the answer is also consistent with yes. So we are inefficient through both lenses. We're inefficient both in terms of if we keep one, if we keep um, production constant, what are we doing with budget? And if we keep budget constant, what are we doing with, with, uh, power, with public goods production? Right? Um, the, the concluding remarks is that this is a very new exercise. This is the first of its kind here for Brazil in terms of um, green budget tagging. It is, um, there is room from what we've analyzed so far for us to grow in terms of efficiency and how we're dealing with what is green, what is green um, expenditure in Brazil. Uh, we are currently undergoing a process of validating our tagging criteria. So we didn't use a very sophisticated mathematical model to identify um, like uh, Bradson did, but we are going um, through with the ministries and saying, okay, so this is the tagging. This is what we've identified as your programs and um, your uh, your budgetary objectives. Is this correct? And we are validating that right now. We are going to extend the analysis to include tax expenditures because this is just very straightforward um, but like uh, very straightforward expenditures. But here in Brazil, our hypothesis is that we're going to see a lot, a lot more inefficiency regarding um, ex green expenditures when we look at tax expenditures. And then governmental transfers, because Brazil is a very heterogeneous um, country, we have over 70% uh, of our municipalities heavily rely on federal transfers um, to, uh, to function. So we're going to extend the analysis for that. And then naturally try to further our DEA specification, and then hopefully in the future be able to go into a welfare analysis with where we will be more concerned with effectiveness rather than efficiency. Thank you very much. Um, so now we will take questions, maybe thank you.
repetitive kind of one shot. Project, but you might think about have a different, you know, might be By the firms in those particular Minimum net present value, which the net Uh, first of all, congratulations to focus on the third. I think I, I just have a, a another one. Um, uh, uh, I think that there is close to my, to, to my second. I'd, um,
ภาพจริงคือแอนเซอร์ดีสเฟิร์สต์ทีแล้วเราจะดูอีกหนึ่งวันขอบคุณที่ดูการสังเกตการณ์ที่เราทำให้เราเห็นว่าเราทำได้ทุกอย่างที่
this type of, for example, vertical restraint. Um, so actually, but I don't know what would be the consequence for for the analysis itself. How how the how detailed the analysis would be. Uh, what but we what something else that we're doing is that we're trying to see what's the evolution in more detail, more autocorrelation or transition matrices. And and what we see is that uh, the, the matrices are matrices are pretty stable. You may have one or two cases that are, have very low or very high within conduct, uh, but then it reverts to the average, which is the standard way that they are. So thank you uh, for your comments. Um, so first, I would like to say that you're completely right that it is very important to adjust by government structures. What we did do was analyze budgetary unit per year. And because the DEA analysis allows us to look at that, and, and we could potentially run a semi-parametric approach where our first stage would be sort of institutional variables, which then we would incorporate number of civil servants, um, where was this and where wasn't this. Um, that would be, uh, that is, that would be like a possible extension and a more careful uh, consideration of institutional characteristics behind. Um, but I would argue that budget is a pretty good instrument to look at efficiency in terms of uh, we, not effectiveness, but efficiency, because um, when we want to look at what the government is uh, actually doing, uh, I mean, one of the ways that a very clear cut way to look at it is just how much are you spending, right? Of course, it doesn't mean that if you spend more, you're better, but it does mean that you're doing something about it, right? You're spending in terms of human capital, you're spending in terms of investments, you're spending in terms of um, even transfers, direct transfers, right? So I would argue that, I would argue that budget is a pretty good indicator of efficiency. I would argue that it's not a good indicator of effectiveness. Um, and I would also, um, I do agree with you as well that there is a lot to be done in terms of adaptation infralegally, um, but especially in terms of adaptation, like when you think about what happened yesterday, that is adaptation and that requires public investment. It may require public investment, a very low public investment, because you could have a concession model where governments would say, okay, now we need to adapt our electrical grids to electrical cars, plus air conditioning, plus more people with um, access. So right now um, we're having, because of the drought in the Amazon, we're not being able to buy uh, um, fans. Fans have run out because they are shipped out from um, uh, Manaus because of the Zona Franca de Manaus. So we're not being able to get them because we don't have water in Manaus. Um, so, uh, and the heat waves are here. So thinking about how we adapt will mean to some extent public investment. It doesn't need to be majoritarily public investment. And so we have different types of public desi uh, financial designs that could be put into it. But uh, I, I do think that both adaptation and mitigation do need public expenditure. Like you can't, it's not going to get done. And and the reason behind uh, the logical reason or the argumentative region, reason behind this is very just uh, traditional, you know, market failure, collective action, public goods problems, very traditional um, problems that you would see. So, uh, thank you very much for your comments. I've written them all down. So now, um, time for one more set. Professor Dehnahu, anybody else? A question for Bradson. Uh, analysis, I thought that was, that was really interesting. And, and you mentioned a whole bunch of different methods that, and, and you chose a few. One that you didn't mention, which a lot of people use, is topic modeling, right? So I, I, I was thinking one idea would be <clears throat> you do a topic modeling on those, on the, 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 on the text. And what, what I imagine that the topics would be, maybe it'd be really cool if they came out like to, um, one top, one of the, yeah, 10 topics, right? And, and one, one of the topics is personnel, the other is infrastructure, the other is uh, investment or something like that. And then something that you could do with, with those, with, with you have a distribution of topics for each, you could uh, make a network where you, where you link uh, municipalities to each other 
depending on 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 these distributions how uh, 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 it uh, change it from a, a two two mode network to a one mode network so then you'd have um, a, a network of municipalities some are linked to each other and then you do sort of like a cluster analysis to see maybe the clusters would be your same result right the guys with the the, the accountant offices or, or maybe something else and then that, that would give you some way to analyze which ones are, are are doing it one way or another way it's just an idea but it's uh, it's very interesting at least. Uh, yeah uh that's a great idea we, we haven't tried that and i think it's good to to find several different methods to compare and we are trying to intend to, to do that thank you Thank you guys very much for your attention, for your careful uh, considerations. Uh, we've all taken notes and we appreciate the time. Thank you very much for, to the organizers as well for an amazing event and an amazing panel. Now our coffee break is being, uh, is being um, served in uh, over there in the middle part of the building. So. Short announcement, short announcement. We, have, we have a quick coffee break. We go to the last academic session that has uh, special special flavor. One would be a typical academic session. The other one would be a book lounge session. Authors of, of several books are going to talk about their book. And then this session is finished. We go back to the leisure part, not for uh, another class <laughs> from Professor Scott Baker. But for enjoying the cocktail and the signing, if you get a book, you could ask for the author to sign and enjoy the exhibits. And if you want to, uh, the, uh, the artists will be there too. So uh, let's enjoy our coffee break. <laughs>
Eu acho que tem. Hi everyone, welcome to the last academic session of the day. After this session, it's party. So <laughs> let's enjoy. Hi, let, let's begin the section of federalism. Start with the presentation of Rafael Penteca. Rafael. Good afternoon to all. First of all, I would like to thank the organization for the kind invitation to discuss a topic that is occupying my research for a long time. I will, will start talking about the judicialization of subnational public debt here in Brazilian Supremo Tribunal Federal, which is the highest court in our judicial system, and also try to correlate this interest phenomenon with the literature of political business cycle. First of all, I would post some quotations that pretty much express the state of our federation. Uh, since the beginning of our current uh, constitutional experience to nowadays, I mean, the 
our constitution was based on a, a very interest decentralization regarding uh, legal tradition. But after 35 years, we still have like, the, the words of great political leaders or a maximum political leader, um, this function between what we expect in terms of federation, especially fiscal federalism, and what we are able to deliver. So in this sense, we'll mix uh, a brief That we that we will be about fiscal and federalist conflicts in Brazil, some how triggered by controversies involving state indebtedness, and especially like what I call federal public debt with federal government as credit uh, guarantor. So in this sense, I would be especially worrying about cases brought before the court by union and or states. Also, uh, in terms of the legal framework, we can also talk about some political parties, but I believe that it's not the case to access the specifics of our judicial review. And in this sense, the institutional performance of the Supreme Tribunal Federal and its federalist jurisprudence somehow. First of all, our problem will be, as I said before, the correlation between judicialization of public debt and also political business cycles. I I believe that was an accidental problem because as I was specifically interested in the fiscal and the federalist performance, but and also our methodology was originally based on legal augmentation and a traditional legal dogmatic. But after recurring to other sources and data, it was very clear that somehow our court was responsive to political business cycles. But in this sense, the pre preliminary answer based on review of literature and also constitution engineering was that the court has demonstrated a pendular orientation, centrifugal and centripetal, regardless of litigation time. I said that is a feature of constitutional engineering because it's very counterintuitive that the timing plays an uh, important role since the judiciary, by definition, should be independent and have a constitutional order as decision framework. So we had a problem in our applied social science literature, and this I mean, especially political science, economy, public sector economy, and also law. I think uh, uh, actually about uh, the, the, the conduct or the behavior of the Supreme Court and its case law regarding the centralization or decentralization in terms of fiscal federalism. Uh, I hold saying that the judicialization of federal issues is particularly favor to the union and to the executive branch. This in comparative perspective is almost a common sense that constitutional courts in some way favors 
is the federal government in some terms. But also, more recently, our literature starts to see that the court, in terms of civil actions based on primary competence, also favor state claims. Yeah? So that was a dubious behavior or a pendular conjecture that I'm, I'm talking about. So we start to, to analyze this data set basically on three factors, right? trying to explain why there is this, this pendular fashion behavior. And the three factors was basically the moment, the procedural instrument, and decisional framework. The moment, especially because in applied social science, states that after June 2013, or maybe the uh, recession, economic recession in 2000. 14, and especially the dissonance or at, between the Republican branch that came from 2016 towards. That was the moment issue that would explain somehow this new behavior of the Supreme Court. In terms of procedural instruments, the likelihood of centralization or decentralization based on the type of class. Basically, the abstract or concrete judicial review. And the decision framework was based on what was especially in front of the constitutional judge, if that was based on the prices of state public accounts, or it was able the controversy arose as a systemic issue to the stabilization of the national economy. So that was the, the preliminary answer in how we try to explain this factor. To uh, a brief comment on methodology um, that was basically public finance law thesis, and somehow it does not proceed with a, a lot of law economics special techniques, but basically it was a qualitative methodology, but with an intermediate data set, oh, the sample of 139 cases. Recur to primary and secondary source and data. And the techniques were basically literature review, term structure review, decision, decision analysis, and also discourse analysis and case study. That was progress being aggregated as the as I told you, legal argumentation or other techniques was based, was not sufficient to explain this type of behavior. That's what I mean with a uh, dental problem. A brief note on our constitution is that the matter of public indebtedness is very relevant in our current constitution. And that explains somehow uh, how we can judici judicialize that topic. And also it's uh, in terms of in the long term is also a very important feature because since the imperial constitution has been a uh, subject to constitutional order, the constitutionalization of public credit. And somehow these structural features that we can explain even in terms of path dependency. In our mixed judicial review system, explain somehow how it's 
almost inevitable that we have this macro litigation in terms of public finance before this meeting. What became very clear when go to the legal framework is basically that the federalization negotiation of state debts these fiscal bailouts conducted by the union constitutional a fundamental aspect of our federalism and somehow at least in the lens of legal academia explains some empirical denial of comparative and balanced fiscal federalism so this is why a topic that in some experience are not relevant or significant, in our case, it's very important that basically 2% of our GDP is judicialized in these terms of federative public debt. I will not be tiresome to go through all this legal framework. What I can say is basically that we have a long history of attempts to address in definite ways this particular question. So we are talking about 20 years with finance, or maybe some programs of restructuring and fiscal adjust adjustment was particularly important. If that goes on. Right? Yeah. Beginning at 2014, we have the complementary law 148. Try to reduce our state debt, uh, changing the contract index, and that's go on. Complementary law 10551 and so forth. We are trying it. I stopped there in 2021, mainly because uh, that was my time lapse of my research. But if you go to the last complementary law, which is the 201, it's about public debt. The compensation of our VAT reductions that happened last year. That was main address in the, the last one, 200, also about that. That's the one. It was a, a decision or option that I can go back if it becomes somehow interesting in the audience, but I didn't. Uh, I, I choose not to present all the cases, but the tendency is basically that. The hypothesis, the pendular conjecture was not robust. So it was disproved based on investigation outcomes. Somehow there is a missed point that we are not able to visualize. not not only the federalization or negotiation of public debt, but the judicialization also is a structural component of Brazilian federation uh, that destroys our factor, the time factor in 2014 or 2016. That goes back to the First Republic and so on. Also, there is a, a component that basically said about the power between uh, president and governor that are basically they use in times of the, the Supreme Tribunal Federal and the National Congress as institutional arbitration to basically uh, address these issues of public debt. And that's also not very clear, the criteria, because 
the same issue somehow, depending on how fast one of these instances go, can be addressed in the, the court or national congress. That became very explicitly clear uh, because of the current government is having some trouble with the coalition in national congress that should somehow to judicialize the questions and go to courts to have the same result. That's also peculiar. So, what defines the likelihood of to, to choose to address the question in the court is basically a political alignment between the with the counterpart, I say governance present or present to governance, or the previous incumbent. When we have a change of political group in states, uh, the current governor is more likely to judicialize the question. So, I said that in a legal standard point, uh, timing should not be that significant variable, but actually it's crucial. Um, it's essential to court's engagement with these confederate conflicts. So the parts present in governance initiate the discussion based on the political alignment between federal and state government or between the past governor and the current governor. In the courts, we start to engage in these aspects that are responsible to conjecture and collective experience. And somehow it's, it's addressed in terms of political business cycle. That we have uh, extensive literature about that, mainly on elected political branches, but not frequent in terms of constitutional courts or courts at all. So maybe that's the pathway to investigate. And somehow the legal reason and really uh, ruling outcomes are in some degree related to the case of national politics in the country's macroeconomic conjecture. In these terms, we have maybe uh, rent, rentful studies that try to correlate macroeconomic and courts specifically. But in these terms, to explain a particular issue that came to my mind why in some cases very bad law uh, denies uh, a discussion to renegotiate the uh, state to public debt and in other cases very good law does not so it's about time in some degree in terms of discussion these Republican disagreements on debt, and Republican disagreements, I say, executive branch and legislative branch, and also the judicial one, are responsible to two factors or two points of view. So the first one is endogenous, uh, based on the internal deliberative process, because we have a coordination issue between 11 judges and the instruments that the controversy arose in terms of ex also a perception of macroeconomic governance mismanagement. I was able to find just a study, Professor Lee Epstein, that tried to correlate the Supreme Court of the United States in the Great Depression in the New Deal and normal time that somehow it has in a typical times some degrees of difference. 
So basically, this is the state of my paper. Thank you very much for all the attention. Okay, thank you, Rafael. Continue with the video presentation. So, uh, good afternoon to you all. Uh, my name is Rodrigo, and first of all, I would like to thank the organization for this opportunity. Um, I'm going to present my, uh, my paper. It's called Strategic Partisan Transfers and Analysis for Brazil's South and Sovereign Region with Professor Bugarini. Uh, so, uh, Intergovernmental transfers are uh, have an important role on fiscal federalism. Uh, in 2000, uh, 2000 um, and, uh, 19, uh, they represented about uh, half of all Brazilians' uh, revenues uh, from, the, from our municipalities. And indeed, there were uh, some cases in which this number uh, reached in value of uh, 70 percent. So you can see that uh, this kind of transfers, you know, transfers in general, uh, have a significant role in uh, municipalities' revenues. Uh, indeed, uh, many uh, municipalities uh, depends on them to 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 uh, execute uh, investments. Uh, but on the other hand, they also, uh, many times they are used for other uses, like uh, political partisans uh, uses, mainly favoring uh, the, the, the allies of the incumbents. Well, uh, so uh, what is the background? Of, what is the uh, context of, of of them on fiscal federalism. Uh, one can say that, uh, that their main uh, uh, background is to optimize uh, the provision of public services, uh, mainly, mainly because uh, the governors or the, the mayors, they would know better uh, their local needs uh, than the higher government, higher levels of government. Um, they also have an important role on uh, on externalities handling, like on provide the provision of public services, and finally, they also help uh, to enhance the equity on public spending, as with transfers from higher level of governments, you can make a uh, lower level of governments to uh, you can help them to, uh, to provide a better level of public services and, the, and thus uh, diminish the, the difference among them and the higher, the most developed cities. You can say uh, there are two main types of transfers, uh, the legal and the cons or constitutional ones, uh, which are based on, well, on the constitutional or in legal or uh, other uh, kinds of, um, of uh, how can I say, instruments. 
and also the voluntary or discretionary transfers, um, which are more uh, help discretionary uh, and also can uh, does have more uh, political use or political partisan use, which is indeed the topic of this uh, presentation. Well, here in Brazil, uh, this this kind of transfers are uh, executed uh, through grant well, what we call grant contract contracts or convenience. Their main goal is to uh, execute public investments in uh, works and services. Um, they are uh, allocated in the public uh, public budget in uh, through parliamentary amendments and also budgetary programs without prior specification of beneficiary with subsequent, uh, subsequent expression of interest from the municipalities. Well, the literature uh, used to have two main, uh, main theories thus far. The co uh, core voters ones, which talked about a loyal voters, you can interpret it this way. Those were the, the voters that would have strong opinion on their uh, on a party or uh, some representative representative, and also the swing voters, which were the undecided voters. Uh, but recently, uh, the Bulgarian and Marcinio uh, developed the strategic partisan transfers hypothesis or SPGA, which says that uh, the president would indeed transfer higher amounts to aligned mayors, but only in the case the, the corresponding governor uh, was not also aligned. But you may ask me why, why this would this happen? Uh, the idea is in this case, the president will leave uh, the transfers to the municipalities in the under the governor's responsibility because, well, the governor would know better uh, as we talked before, uh, what would be the local needs than the president or uh, the central government itself. There was uh, Bugarin and Marcelliuk indeed did uh, research on this, but it was uh, it lacked, was not a possible to include uh, states, the states transfers to the municipal municipalities in their, in their, their work. But, uh, Garofalo did it for the United States, and we do now uh, for Brazil. Well, so what about our, our model? Our main hypothesis is among uh, the municipalities with a uh, mayor aligned to the president, uh, you can think of a uh, partisan alignment, the, the mayor and the president being from the same party. Uh, those in which the corresponding governor from the Corresponding state would, is also from the same party, uh, would receive fewer federal transfers, voluntary transfers, uh, than those in which the governor is from another party. Uh, well, our sample is municipalities uh, from Brazil, south and southern regions. We chose this uh, the sample mainly because, uh, I mean, because the, those were the only regions in, for which we had data available on uh, state transfers to the municipalities thus far. Uh, the time period was from uh, 2013 to 2019, because mostly because of Santa Catarina's uh, transfers from, from to their municipalities. And we used a fixed defects panel data model we considered only the transfers signs with local governments, and we excluded the health sector uh, related transfers. Um, why? Because uh, the responsibility of fiscal law uh, says that trans uh, health related transfers are not considered discretionary grants because mainly because of their magnitude here in the so. For the federal government, there were about 37,000 contracts uh, with a, an amount of 
16 billions or a yearly average of 2.2 billions. For these states, uh, there were 44,000 contracts with an amount of 22 billions or a yearly average, average of 3.2 billions. Our model uh, is as shown. We use the federal FDT, you can think of federal voluntary transfers uh, to the municipality. Uh, the mayor, uh, uh, president only, and mayor, governor, president are partisan alignment dummies. X line is in a vector including municipalities, social demographic, political, and fiscal characteristics. There's a year dummies vector. Uh, municipality level fixed the defects and the error term. Our control variables were for the fiscal ones, the local tax revenues, the personal expenses from the, the municipalities, and also the investment spending. Uh, all of them were got from the Secretariat, uh, uh, the National Treasury Secretariat, and all of them were taken uh, per capita, the monetary variables. And we took also the natural log of the of them, so you can think of think of them as elasticities. For the socials, social variables, we we took the Gini index, which we calculated through the highest declarations. Uh, we know that the highest declarations do not include the formal sector of Brazil. But we did so because uh, there was not a, the new, the latest cent, uh, Brazil census uh, 2022 was not available uh, this far. And also, we, we used the natural log of the population size from IBGE. We got also the mayors, for, for the mayors, uh, individual characteristics. We got the, his or her gender, age and years. Level, level of education and a journey for second term mayors in order to check if there would be an advantage or disadvantage for them. Uh, this, our estimated uh, data is right here. I don't know if, if it's possible to see so far, but we also have this, only this variables here. Uh, well, what we estimate is the difference between uh, beta three and beta two, which are the, the both alignment dummies, mayor president only and the govern the mayor govern uh, government president governor president. So our different uh, our difference was uh, significant uh, for the level of five percent, which well. We got also a, a negative result, uh, which implies oh, more money, uh, that municipalities from well, for which both the mayor and their corresponding governor are, are aligned to the federal government uh, receive about 17 lower uh, FDTs or federal voluntary grants than the counterparts. Um, counterparts. That would mean about uh, 3.6 highs per inhabitants in terms of 2019. Also, second term mayors would get a, about 33% lower discretionary grants than, uh, than first term mayors, which, uh, well, would uh, imply that maybe. Uh, Second term mayors would be less interesting to the president or because they could not be re-elected for the same uh same uh same position. And also the population size uh, would negatively affect the per capita transfers, which maybe would imply in uh, gains of scale. Well, so to summarize, we may say that the, the, the main idea behind the strategic partisans hypothesis uh, holds for, for example, for our, our example, 
And also, well, the, our main limitation here would be the use of only two Brazilian regions. Uh, we, we hope that for uh, for uh, posterior works, more data, data is available, so more regions can be included. Hope, hopefully, all Brazilian regions. But uh, that's it. Thank you for uh, for your time. And, Thanks, Rodrigo. Uh, where are you next? Yeah. All right, can you hear me? Um, thank you so much for keeping me into this. Thank you, uh, Maurice. You, you can hear me properly, right? So uh, this is this uh, paper is actually joint work with Enrique Seira. He used to be at ITAM, and now he's at um, Michigan State University. And with uh, Fred Finan and Ernesto Balbo, who are professors at the Haas, Okay, so we have have twenty five minutes. Okay, so um, this is part of a long agenda work on on courts. Um. And this has to do with something that I haven't talked about previously in the Laule meetings, which has to do with um, commons. Form, there's a formal constitutional right in many civil law countries, including Mexico, to receive your notice personally and also at your address. Personal notifications are then a major source of the courts, and there are high caseloads, there's a lot of shirking, and there's a there's a lot of talk of corruption in these uh, A key feature of this situation is that the notifier, the court notifier, who is usually a lawyer, a licensed lawyer who works for the court, like a court official, has a lot of monopoly power because the traditional way that this works is uh, a case file comes in and it has a, case, a number that ends, let's say, in one, two, or three. So in this court, Abe Wickle Gretton is the notifier of the case files that end in one, two, and three. And so if he doesn't notify them, they just don't go forward. So Abe has all this monopoly power and everybody knows that the case files ending in one, two, three go to, go to Abe. Right? And I want to mention that there's a lot of different types of corruption that can happen, right? So there can be plaintiffs who are trying to get their case to go forward who might <clears throat> offer a bribe to Abe uh, to get through the red tape. So this might give Abe um, an incentive to shirk so that he can have this big pile of cases. And whenever they show up and say, look, I'm trying to get my case notified, he says, oh, you mean all this? A lot of, I have a lot of case files. You are really far away in the, in the law. And that would incentivize this red tape type corruption. Also, Abe could sell his services to the defendants, not to the plaintiffs. So he could get uh, delay. He could get uh, either delay or manipulation of these notifications. And he could do something even worse, which is he could pretend that he notified the defendant when he didn't. And then the defendant may not answer the lawsuit. They'll end up losing. It. And then they'll have, you know, assets or buildings or whatever seized. So that, could, that would be the worst thing. So one of the issues that we, the reason that we started this experiment is because we thought about rotating caseloads and using a random assignment and thinking about how this could affect corruption. So we were trying to think about corruption from the very beginning, but the courts are also very interested in efficiency and how long it takes to get the notification done and so on. So you'll see 
that the results are about efficiency and also about corruption. In a, in a pilot that I did uh, without all these co-authors some years ago, when Laule was just starting out, uh, we tried this as a pilot program, not a real RCT, because it was just an intervention. So we took eight notifiers, who or 10 notifiers, who were employees of five individual labor courts. We took them out of the courts. We created a centralized office, and we made them rotate on a daily basis across regions on, an, on a randomization that they could not observe before they were given their caseload, and then they had to return the case files each day. So we found there that actually the success rate did go up by something quite significant, uh, well over 10%. But in that, it was an intervention. It was not, we didn't have a simultaneous control group, and it was a small number uh, of, of notifiers. And we didn't really uh, manage to get good evidence of reduction in corruption. Although we heard lots of anecdotes, right? We heard people talking in the hallway saying, oh, now we don't have to pay the notifiers because the centralized office will, you know, put our case file into their, into the routes that they're, into the, the assignments that they're getting. Okay. So in this RCT, we try to, to test the effect of rotation. Okay. So what's the experimental design? I have to start going quicker. We have 50 court notifiers in charge of all the first notifications in a labor court, which is the largest in Mexico City, could be one of the largest in the country, in the region. It has 20 individual courts and all of those 20 each has a judge. And then above them, there is the, the administration of the tribunal. So we were working with the labor court, which is the whole tribunal. And I'm going to call each one of those, in the, those 20 courts individual labor court. We divided the city into 25 regions. We created 25 similar pairs of, of notifiers. And then we did a, a bingo, like a bingo machine thing, which we video up, which I'm not going to show you, but we did take video. Um, and we assigned the pairs that were similar. So we thought that Alvaro and Julio were very much alike. So we put them in a pair. And then we randomly assigned them and they got assigned, let's say, to region five. And then we took another, uh, you know, bingo machine thing and we assigned, let's say, Julio to be a rotator. That means that each time he gets a caseload, he's going to potentially get a different caseload from one of the 25 regions of the city. And we assigned Alvaro to be a fixed guy. So he always got, you know, that region number five, whereas Julio rotated each time. Okay. And then we created the daily case assignments ourselves so that we wouldn't have sort of something else messing up the experiment. And the fixed uh, files assignments were given to the fixed notifier in each region. And there was a daily randomization of the rotating notifiers. When I say daily, uh, sometimes this wasn't actually each day because it takes them a while to go do the whole route to come back and then to turn in their notification reports. So most of this experiment, it was every other working day. So on one week, you did Monday, Wednesday, Friday. On the next week, you did Tuesday, Thursday, and so on. Of course, I say most of this because the pandemic interrupted this experiment for many months, and then we had to come back. So there was a bit of a mess. Uh, and then they had to turn in their notification report, whether it was successful or not. And we also designed and gave them a phone app which um, automated their notification reports, so that reduced their workload. And it also allowed us to geolocate them every five minutes, roughly, while they were on their route. So all of this we did to both of them, the rotators and the fixed cut. And you may be thinking, this is a hell of a lot of monitoring you're doing on these guys. And that's true. So the major problem with this experiment is that we did not really have a pure control group. And you'll see the effects of not having a real control. The reason we had to do this is otherwise we wouldn't have data. Okay. So the main experiment, which is the one I'm telling you about, I'm going to go straight into the result. You won't really see um, like an econometric specification. The econometric specifications are all very simple because this is just experimental. <clears throat> We've controlled for things like gender, wage, 
and tenure, which are like basic observables in these case files, and that have a lot to do with the value of the case, except for gender shouldn't have to do with the value of the case, but it does. Uh, so we control for those things. But other than that, I'm not going to show you an econometric specification so we can get through the paper. Okay. So what do you see? We actually did worse. So the people who were in the treatment group, they actually were, uh, they failed more. It's not a very huge effect. If you look at the very bottom line of the table, you can see that uh, the bottom line is here. You can see that this is out of 0.584 that failed. So it's not a very big effect, but there is a significant and negative effect, which looks like they didn't know all these regions. And so if you were moving them around all the time, maybe they were just worse at locating the, the, the addresses in order to do the link. Um, we also looked at like, were they more or less successful conditional on being in proximity? Because in this pain experiment, we were able to geolocate all these guys on a, you know, on a regular basis during the route that they, that they follow. And so you can see it looks like maybe they lie less because conditional on not being in proximity, the address at the time that they say they were there in their notification report, they're actually less successful. So a lot of their not success is concentrated there. So maybe it is that they lie a bit. Um, it also looks like they days until reception, which is this one. They take less days to give us back the case file, which seems to be interesting. It has to do with the fact that they now have to go tomorrow. They're going to get a caseload from another region. So they just don't, there's no point in them keeping the case file. And one of the things that the fixed guys seem to do is they keep the case file to signal to the parties, the, the worker particularly, that if you don't pay me, it's not going to get notified. But these guys, they can't keep the case. So it seems like there's some action going on there. They also use the app a lot more. So look at this. These are very strong results. This tells me that they're more likely to be geotracked. They're more likely to take a photograph. They're more likely to be geotracked when they take the photograph. And they're more likely to take a photograph while they're in proximity. So it just... This may be that they're being less corrupt. It also may be that they just don't know the city. And so they use the phone more because the phone's actually going to help them to find the place. Right? Okay. And then on their daily routine, they, they travel less. They spend less time inside the court. They seem to be out, you know, outside the court more. And they use the phone a lot more days. So that's also interesting results. Now some results on, um, on, on bribery. So we did a massive number of surveys uh, on, at the hearings with the parties. And the only thing we find here is this, which is a pretty weak result. There, okay. It's not small. Again, look at the mean. You see this mean is, quite, is not that big. So this is actually not that small. However, it's not a very strong result. Okay. Uh, and then also we see that uh, those who are treated are less likely to believe that the defendant can manipulate notifications. So that's also, there seems to be a little bit of weak evidence about the effect on corruption. Um, this I'm going to skip over, but basically this is interesting in the sense that when a case file is not notified, the case file gets sent to the court, the hearing is held, and then it's sent back to the notification office. So on the first round, our treated guys, the ones who rotate, they are less successful. But on subsequent rounds, they're more successful. So this phenomenon is, if I gave it to Abe, and he was a fixed guy, and he didn't notify it because he's already received some money from the defendant, next time it comes around, he's not going to notify it either. But if I gave it to Alvaro, who was a rotating no, Alvaro was a fixed guy. I gave it to Julio, who was the rotating guy, and he didn't notify it because he actually did receive a small bribe, maybe, or maybe he's just a bad notifier. When it comes back, it might go to Mauricio. And Mauricio is a new, he's like, it's like a new slate. So he probably could notify, right? Okay. So that's good for the parties, 
but it's a lot of churn, right? It's happening through this churn in the, in the theory. Okay. So let me skip through and say, and then since we had all this time during the pandemic to think about all these bad results, we decided to try to do some new experiments within the context of the same RCT. So our objective was to create a real pure control group. Um, we wanted to compare the notifications attempted by our notifiers with those of those 20 individual labor courts that kept some of their notifiers, right? The whole court had something like 150. We were given 50 for this experiment. And there were a hundred that were kind of, you know, in those 20 courts. So what we did was we um, allowed them to send us case files on a subsequent attempt at the first notification when the first one had been unsuccessful. Um, but we actually went to the courts on some days to pick up those case files. And on other days we didn't. And we, we made sure that these were case files that had just concluded a scheduled hearing. There was one or more pending first notification. The next hearing date was far enough away so that we actually could credibly attempt these. And there were no pending other administrative procedures. The assignment, like I said, was done at the day times individual court level. So basically you went some days and other days not and this followed a randomization. We reviewed the physical case files on the treatment days, but on the days that we didn't go, we had access to the court scanned case files. So we revised them you know, from a PDF. We had some imperfect compliance and we're doing a lot of data gathering to try to fix that. But I don't want to talk about it because I'd rather explain what the results. Uh, so our eligibility problems look like our, our problems with compliance look like this. You are going to see regressions where green plus green is treatment, and this green plus green, which were eligible but not, but not treated, are the control, right? But we still have some coding to do, so some of these results might, might get updated, okay? All right. So this is a balance table and it looks it looks good because if you don't, you know, mostly we don't see stars. We have an incredibly tiny amount in bi-weekly, I think that's wage. I don't know why that says paid. It should be bi-weekly pay, um, but it's, it's very tiny. So we're not very worried about balance for now. Okay, uh, so, Another thing, in these previous slides, you saw this stuff about being in proximity. So now you're not going to see anything more about being in proximity because some of these were guys who were at the courts and didn't use the phone app. So we have no, we have really no way of knowing if they were in proximity or not, right? These guys, the whole point of it being a pure control is they can lie to us very, uh, you know, impunely. So there's none of that. Okay. Um, all right, so what do we see? We actually see here that we have a, a, a treatment effect on whether the case file is in the first procedural stage or not. How does the case file get out of the first procedural stage? By having all the defendants notified. So this means that um, our case files that we treated are more likely to have all the defendants notified. Okay, so there is now a quote unquote efficiency effect in favor of these guys that we were supervising, right? And the other, um, the other coefficients in this table, they go in the right direction, but they aren't significant. Um, and then here, the, whether the lawyer, we asked in the survey whether the lawyer had contact with the notifier and they're less likely to have had contact with the notifier. And that's a big effect. It's something like 25% or close to 25% over baseline. So it seems like when you take the case file to these, this office where every, you know, at least half the people are rotating, you just make it, you increase the coordination costs of corruption. So it's difficult for these guys to find who the notifier is so they can try to bribe the notifier. 
Um, and there's less cases where they say that the notifier asked for any type of aid to speed up the notification. So usually they'll say, I need some support. They use the word apoyo in Spanish, which, which doesn't mean bribe, but it's like a nice way of saying, I need your support so that I can um, notify the case. Um, and then in their general opinion about corruption, notice that these guys are less likely, the, the, the plaintiffs are less likely to agree that lawsuits only go forward if workers or lawyers give money. So that, again, is another sort of piece of evidence saying that there's an impact here on efficiency and also on corruption and kind of both of these go in the way that we would like them to go. Now we, we for this pure control experiment, we now run, so here you had eligible treated and those were the ones that came to the centralized notification office. So they could be rotators or they could be fixed counts. Now we're going to separate those eligible treated into rotators and fixed to see if there's any action here, okay? So it looks like the effect on the case file is in the first procedural stage gets watered down because they get, get split. But if you look at the last one that says, well, the second one, all defendants have been notified. And then on the last one, number of hearings till all defendants were notified. You can see that you still have some effects. Um, the lawyer had, a in the lawyer who's representing the worker had contact with the notifier is still negative and big, but it doesn't look any different for the rotators or for the fixed guys. Um, and in terms of the bribery, we have something on the lawyer asked for transport aid, for money or for you to take him in an Uber or something, or bring your car and take him. Um, and so that's, that's a bit smaller and it looks marginally significant for the eligible treated rotators and not for the other guys, but it's not really a result. So again, we don't see much in the difference between the two schemes of rotation and not rotation, but we do see a, uh, quite a bit in, they were still at the court with no supervision versus they were. With, okay. And in the general opinion of the plaintiffs about corruption, again, we get stuff that's negative and we get, you know, we get smaller effects. It looks very weakly, like maybe the rotators have a stronger effect, but it's, it's um, again, it's not, the difference between those two is not significant. Okay, so I, I'm at almost 21 minutes and I'm on my conclusion slide, so it's good. So what, what did we do? We set out to prove or disprove effects of rotation in an RCT methodology. We found a small negative effect on efficiency and no or weak uh, effect on corruption. It was basically a failed experiment. But we sort of figured out uh, from early on that there were spillover effects, or maybe you want to call them experimental infrastructure effects. It's, you know, that you can't run an RCT if you don't have enough administrative data to follow the people that you're trying to follow. And to do that, you have to impose so much more supervision than they have to begin with because these are just like, you know, free agents to give case files and they work on the street, they do whatever they want, they come back with the reports. So there's like no supervision. So you have to supervise them because you can measure other ones. Uh, so we ran another experiment trying to get a pure control group and compared with pure control, the centralized notification office is more successful and it looks like it reduces corruption Maybe there are stronger effects in the rotation, but mostly we can say that the notifications are more successful and it looks like there's less corruption. Does not get at whether it's worth doing random rotation of caseloads for low level bureaucrats. We haven't yet answered that question, uh, but I think we answered some other interesting questions so far. So I look forward to your comments. Thank you, Joyce. Last one will, will be my, my presentation.
session will be about uh, tort law, specifically about uh, state liability. Uh, state liability, is, considering the, the contemporary scenario, it's um, it's the theme of of the fashion. You we can see this. Uh, it, it emerged in the firmament of the contemporary literature of thought law. Okay. And on the other side, we see that uh, the growing use of economic analysis of law in the study of civil uh, liability, it's another contemporary phenomenon. But paradoxically, uh, what we see is that state liability is a topic leading for in the literature of thought law and economics. Uh, it's a kind of taboo. Uh, I don't know exactly why, but uh, the literature didn't uh, work with, it didn't deal with this system. That's not very common. The only paper that I'm fine <laughs> is the paper of Nuno Garopa, and Giuseppe Dan Dari Machiachi, and Fernando Gomes Pomar. The name is state liability. Uh, what I, 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 my intention is, is to fill this, this gap, try to fill this gap. Uh, the research that we present is part of my research of a uh, postdoc uh, in Faculdade de Direito da Universidade de Lisboa, in the Escola Superior da Advocacia Geral da União, aqui no Brasil. Okay. What is the basic working hypothesis? And the question is, is the contemporary expansion of the spectrum of state liability a phenomenon associated with the mere expansion of the reparatory function of the state, of civil liability? It's something like the state is this universal insurance, uh, a kind of, we can say, is the god of lightning and thunder on one side, and the other question, or this is a phenomenon associated with the prevention of accidents uh, and the maximization of social well-being. Uh, this state has a cheapest cost avoider. Okay. Uh, is structured in two parts. The first one is the foundations of state liability, and the second one, second, second one. Uh, Fundamentals of economic analysis of civil liability or thought work. Go ahead. Oh, is this okay. oh. State liability. Uh, a brief historical uh, evolutionary context. State liability had a uh, is a term that had a, a significant transformation in something like one, one century. The starting point is the absence, absence of responsibility, responsibility. That was a dominant conception until the end of 19th century. Uh, we had the gradual admission uh, of the liability of the state by jurisprudential uh, construction in France. Um, we had the positiveness uh, and approximation of the civil or general civil liability regime. Yeah. There's, okay. even civil, uh, there's even cases interesting in this sense, uh, but not the only one. And we had the constitutionalization, uh, exception that the state liability is an important component of the rule of law. Okay. Again, there's even a uh, paradigmatic case. Uh, we have this, uh, this uh, conception in our constitution since 1946. Go ahead. Uh, in contemporary context, um, in a comparative perspective, uh, dealing with the paper of Nuno and Giuseppe and Fernando. What we see, uh, we can see, we can see that in common law we have a progress uh, at its lower steps. 
within that the, the maintenance of uh, a kind of relative immunity in the liability of public agents and of the state and the application the application of private law rules okay in France in countries of civil law tradition France French civil law tradition we have a more accelerated uh, steps uh, with the erosion of the state immunity advancing in a notable way okay? with the creation of an independent body of the administrative uh, rules. Portugal is the, a good example. Portugal have a, a administrative code that regulates the state liability. Uh, in the context, context of civil law, Germany, uh, no, no, German tradition of German tradition, we have an intermediate state with the application of private law rules and constitutional norms. In some sense, Brazil, uh, Brazil has the, this model. We have the, the constitution uh, provision and the application of the rules of the Brazilian Civil Code of 2002. in the contemporary context, some tendencies. In tort law and, and, and state liability, also we can say that we have um, one interesting phenomenon, that is the transnationality of the operational rules. Uh, in, other, in other words, uh, in our legal systems, uh, we have groups of cases and types of cases that are, are very similar. And the resolution of this case is done with the application of uh, a, doctor, a doctrine uh, of tort law that is basically the same. Uh, we work with the three elements, the damage, the causation, and act of imputation. Now the system is the same. And uh, we have uh, another phenomenon uh, is the, the process of uh, objectifying uh, the state liability. We have a tendency of gradual replacement of negligence by rules of the strict liability of the state. The European Union, uh, in, in European Union, this tendency is very, very present. We can say that. And uh, probably the, the most uh, the leading case uh, is Brazil. In Brazil, we have uh, a constitutional provision of the state liability of the state. Uh, and we have um, two, uh, not, another two rules that are very important. Uh, one of these is that uh, we have to consider the, the concurrent uh, or exclusive fault of the victim as a factor Reduce, reducing or excluding the, the compensation value. And the other one is that we have the, the right to regress in favor of the states against the, the public aid. This is the, the model uh, in Brazil. In many other countries, you can say that we have the same structure. Uh, and what economic analysis of law, of tort law, can say about this? Yeah. Basically, um, introductory aspects, when we talk about uh, tort law in, uh, in economics, we, we consider uh, two ob objectives. The one is might minimize the, the cost of accidents, of course. Uh, and we can say that the, is the, the object is maximize the well-being of the, the society, of the society. Okay. Uh, what is the function of uh, civil liability of tort law? It promotes the state efficient allocation of the damage, and the reparatory function of that law, with a view to generating incentives for the adoption of, of, of optimal 
uh, preventive behavior of the agents. Idea of preventive function. Okay. Uh, now we, we can ask um, the economic analysis of law guidelines support the tend to, to objectify, objectify uh, state liability, the adoption of strict liability considering the state. A question, very interesting question, that the literature usually didn't work with you. Uh, the other one, is the state liability uh, rule that consider the inclusion or reduction of the amount of the compensation in, propor in proportion of uh, the victim concurrent fault? It would be an efficient rule. Other interesting issue. Is the regressive action uh, by the state against the agent, the, the public agents, it's a efficient instrument or another question that you, you can put. Okay, let's see the main considerations that the literature do about this. Uh, the basic one, uh, starting at the beginning. Uh, Guido Calabresi, the idea of cheaper cost avoider. Uh, cheaper cost avoider as an instrument for comparing indivi indivi individual conducts, or, and in, in, in this aspect I consider very important, uh, compare acts or activities of categories. Uh, the idea is to identify uh, who can avoid the, the damage at a lower uh, cost. Uh, considering another perspective, the idea is uh, is to see who have uh, who has the, the comparative advantage in producing safety and reducing accident costs. Okay. Uh, what we will say is not a consensus, but, uh, but uh, I, I consider that uh, it reflects mainly the ideas of Guido Calabresi and the other authors in, in tort law and economics. An efficient uh, system of uh, tort law uh, must be built uh, with simple rules that uh, of strict liability uh, for the cheapest cost avoided agents. Uh, okay, we can say that we have the negligence uh, rule, we have the work of Richard Cos, and we have the, the idea of negligence of efficient rule, but we have this uh, another vision. Okay. Uh, we can work in two ways. The more important for us uh, is uh, what Calabresi says that the generalizing analysis is a kind of category determination done by, in the case of Brazil, by the legislature. The ship is a, a theme that stayed for many, many years, many decades, in a kind of limbo, at least in legal practice. Uh, a recent decision of the American Supreme Court, in the case of liquid systems versus the price, a case of uh, consumer relations. Uh, putting evidence, highlighting the, the idea of shippers cost avoider. It's um, applica a directly application of the idea in a, to solve a specific case, in a retail case. Okay. This decision is of uh, four or five years ago. And what do you see when you consider the, the, the contemporary literature? The, uh, the effects of the rules in, in author and victim. Uh, in a very set, very common set of situations in which it's important to control the level of precaution of the author and the victim. Okay? To control the level of, of activity of the author. To, con to, to correct the problems of asymmetry in the level of information in favor of the author. The correct problems of asymmetry in the level of, ri of risk aversion in favor of the author. Uh, what is the, the main conclusion that we can find in the literature? Uh, is that the rule of strict, of strict liability 
uh, considering the possibility of exclusion or reduction uh, of the compensation value proportional to the victim's cost, produce uh, superior results than a, a poor strict liability rule and the negligence rule and its variance. Okay? You can say that uh, in general sense. And we consider when we consider when we consider the the relation in uh, in which we have uh, three parts. Uh, one part is the, the agency, and the other is the principal and the victim. Uh, we can see in various situations something like uh, the relation between father and son, employee and employee, employee. Uh, the idea of uh, third party liability or vicarious liability, as we used to, to say in the US, uh, there, are, there is a kind of convergence in the adoption of the strict secondary liability of the principal, uh, considering in addiction the possibility of consider the degree uh, of, the fault, of the fault of the agents. Uh, to exercise the, the the right of return. Okay. Uh, what's the logic of this? Uh, it induces, it's a mechanism that induces the exercise of control uh, supervision by the principal in relation to the agent. It's a mechanism that induces the adoption of uh, preventive behavior by the agent. Okay, and that's, that's uh, the basic directive of the literature. Uh, and, we, and when you consider the specific relation between state, public agents, and, and victim, what I can say, at least in my opinion, that the state emerges as a major candidate candidate for the super scope avoider. Uh, um, because in a very uh, lack of situations, very frequent situations, the, the state is in better position to adopt preventive measures. Uh, it's in better position to promote the reduction of the risk of the, the level of the risk activity. Um, usually, he, he has a greater uh, knowledge of the risk condition and, and of how to avoid it. And it's in better position to carry out the social, the social dispersion of the. the uh, another important important issue is that uh, for this strict liability rule of the state, we have to, to to aggregate two factors. One is the consider a mechanism that induces the victim also to have a, a, a preventive behavior and that induces the public agent also to adopt the preventive measures uh, avoided the, the accident. Okay. Uh, going to the conclusions. The rule, in this context, the rule of the strict liability with reduction or, or exclusion of the value of the compensation proportion of the victim fault and, and the right of uh, return in favor of the state, again, the, the public agent, considering the, the, the level of uh, negligence of the public agents, emerges as a model that comes very closely to the to what we can say, the optimal design of a uh, state liability system. It's in my opinion. Uh, and answering the, the, the question that I put in, in the beginning, uh, uh, the working hypothesis, uh, the, in my opinion, the expansion of the spectrum of civil liability of the state that you can see contemporary, uh, with the tendency of the use of, of, of strict liability of these states. Phenomenon associated with the prevention of accidents and then being the basic conclusion uh, answering the, the question. Uh, no, the state is not the god of lightning and thunder, but you can consider that 
é statement do tipo em discurso da Moira. Age and name, in this case, the use of strict liability, very interesting. Basically, it's this. Thank you for the attention. Let's go to the questions. Thank you for all uh, the presentations. Sorry, sir, I, I only have to... First one is... Um... I value very Yeah, thanks. I'm pretty sure there was that, because, <laughs> but I mean, that's part of, you know, you're threatening to a certain extent people's livelihood. Um, I would say that on average, these types of low level court bureaucrats in Mexico are probably earning more from bribes than from their salary. So yeah, I'm sure there was. But that's part of the course, right? That's part, part of what you're trying to do. It's true, we may end up not showing these results, uh, but this is the first time this is, I've ever presented this and I wanted to sort of show what we set out to do because in, in favor of sort of being transparent about what we were trying to do. And, and also because this notion of rotating, of giving people who, um, approve building licenses or giving people who approve driver's licenses or whatever, rotating their caseloads to avoid these procedures being captured by the low-level bureaucrats, I think is actually a policy that has been done, that has been used in many countries, uh, developed and developing. And I think that there isn't that much scientific evidence about its impact. But actually, if you go out there, you see that people do this. So I think that it's a, it's valuable to try and get at that. We, it seems we're not a, really able to do it. Yeah. Thank you uh, all for very enlightening presentations. So I have uh, three questions, uh, one for um, Professor Rafael, one for uh, Professor Rodrigo, and for Professor Joyce, I'm sorry. Those are the ones that I um, I, I feel I, I can actually do it at some level. So, so for Professor Rafael, the question is, when you were looking at the digitalization of public debt, did you see any type of pattern in, the, in terms of re-incidents? So um, subnational debt is frequently renegotiated. Right? Do you see any sort of path dependency regarding which states keep doing this? So, because it may be the case where, well, because I know that at some level the Supreme Court will um, tend my way. I've done this before, I've tested it, I've done it. So I was actually a bit confused because this might just be because I didn't clarification maybe. Um, I 
I don't understand how you don't use it. Degrees of freedom, but um, if you considered using a sort of runner-up side uh, methodology, where the runner-up uh, who, who, like very close race between them, so if the one that won by very little is of the same party as the governor or not, I feel like to some extent maybe that would would you would definitely have less cases, but maybe um, you could capture sort of mayoral. Uh, characteristics more, which might be So, is there is there maybe a a bias, or do you? Because I was thinking, is imagine that you could all of a sudden somebody that's been doing that before. And and then reallocating, um, and then doing the rotation type case activity. But do you think that maybe under that type of scenario, you would, might be some sort of thank you very much. Thank you, Karina, for your comment. It's to grant the opportunity to talk a little bit more. We actually have these variables in terms of frequency of the education. Also has a, a another effect, also in terms of some thesis, but also, this is not new. Uh, the, the bad news is we haven't learned much. I mean, the, the, in terms of creativity of argument, we keep using the same, and that comes to the, the next conclusion, which is basically there is a, a distinct pa pattern between visualization of flux and also initialization of depth stock. When it comes to depth stock, uh, which is okay. quantitative terms are fewer, but they are more relevant in some, in terms of volume. Actually, it's the same states that are the most in depth in, in the sense uh, what I was talking about in terms of the Supreme Court engagement to rediscuss the, 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 the negotiation federalization of property debt, we have basically in this sample of 139 cases that there was a narrow margin or split decisions, six to five in three cases, basically. The first one was uh, in, on the eve of color impeachment, but it was promoted by a party, PSDB, that came like six to four. Uh, then after the Bang Su discussion, the privatization, and it was at the same time of Mesa Long scandal. And the next term is Juma's impeachment. Like in the way that you have complementary laws, 148 and 151. And on the Santa, also Santa Catarina thesis, which is basically about index. And the following, like the previous two, uh, it was maintained, like giving the time burden to states. And in the next, in the last one, it was the opposite, so that was kind of new. And we can go on and on, but the main criteria it's the alternative, like government take the seat and the seat uh, alternative political group 
uh, they see somehow that they don't have the public resources that they might think of. That. And one of the ways is to judicialize the, the, the public debt. But that's the main distinction between flux and stock that is important because when it comes to flux, we have a couple suspensions of the monthly payment. We have that. And it was not basically a less degree of influence to the bureaucracy. Like you have economic bureaucrats and also public lawyers, but that's not something that can uh, be sides of government. But it's a political decision that involves bargaining in the political arena or the courts. So we have that, but we choose to have an intermediate approach and distort in some ways in quantitative terms. But somehow that I hope I answer your question. Thanks for the question. Um, these are mostly selected through they post a position and there are like exams that they have to pass in order to get these positions. However, court notifiers in many courts in Mexico are unionized. And so <laughs> that's an additional issue because it's difficult to have them fired. Uh, and when they do get fired for some kind of malfeasance, they could win reinstatement in court. So the only thing I can say is we interviewed all of them before the experiment started. And we did like, you know, this big five personality test. And we did like another uh, kind of um, multiple choice test that's supposed to get at like ethical values and and so on. We haven't found much action in correlating that with the results. But what we did find is that the people who were newer to this job, who were younger, who had just arrived maybe a year before or two years before, they worked harder in this scheme. They, they, they seem to have done a better job. Uh, and in terms of their efficiency, they were probably as efficient in terms of getting the notifications done as people who had 10 years more experience, which also goes to show you that people stay in these kinds of jobs that have low salaries because of the bribes. Because why else would you, you know, why else would you stay in a job? If you were to get promoted in the court, you could earn three, four times what you're earning as a notifier. But there were many notifiers who were like, you know, in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, and they weren't going anywhere, right? And again, they were unionized. So it's a really nightmarish um, scenario, mostly for the par the parties that actually want to get their cases taken care of. Well, uh, that was a first of all thing. Thanks for the questions. Uh, there was a really nice question. Uh, I believe it, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. We use the for the population. We use the uh, another exhibition, but but the projections on population uh, by uh, IBGE, by Instituto Brasileiro de Geografia. I believe we did so because the estimations would. Uh, I'm not sure right now. I guess they are done like twice per per decade, not only on the census, but there would be no variation. But with the projections, we do get. Uh, variation from the population and about the other question yeah uh that, yeah that's we uh, the uh, using rdgs for uh close elections uh would be great for uh the study uh we unfortunately we didn't have time to do so but uh it's uh and would be an, a contribution for a uh, future uh studies Without a doubt. Thank you. Okay, anyone else?
let's go to the, like to the artistic part of the the meeting. Music and dinner is there, so enjoy. <laughs> 